Alpha. webinar. I hope you're really excited about yesterday's announcement about the new Alpha 7S Mark III I have now in my hands. You've been thousands and thousands like expecting this camera for years and obviously it took us a long time to develop what we believe to be the next best 4K camera um, for video shooters and film filmographers across the world. Um, today, we're going to go in depth with um, our guests and our training uh, partner at Sony uh, about the new features about this camera, but also give you the opportunity to, gi to give you your questions in uh, live. Um, today, I've got with me um, Olivier Schmidt, who is a filmmaker. Um, we've got Philippe Blum, uh, as you probably all know um, um, around uh, the filmography sphere. And we've got also Ben, our training manager, that's going to give us in-depth kind of like look uh, and specification about these new cameras and some live demos. Uh, but first, let's see a recap of the new specs of the new. But to talk about it, enough of me. I think it will be far more interesting for you to understand how Philippe Blum and Olivier Schmidt used it in the last months to shoot the content you've seen yesterday. So first, um, let's jump on to Philippe Blum. Philippe, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. And thank you for being part of this project. You've been testing the Alpha 7S Mark III for the past months. Um, for our audience, could you please quickly introduce yourself and why you chose this particular project um, to shoot? Uh, well, I'm um, Philip Bloom, filmmaker in London, and I think you chose me more than I chose, <laughs> which, was, which is very flattering. <laughs> um, and I've been waiting for this camera, like everybody else, um, for about five years, because well, maybe less than five years, because we the last model was five years ago. Mm. I don't think we were waiting for a, the set. You know, I think it was about four years we've been waiting, because the first one came out in 2014, the second one in 2015, and it's been that long wait. And for me, it was, you know, it was an amazing camera, and I've used the A7S and A7S II for um, documentaries and TV and stuff a lot, and I've loved it, and I've just been waiting for it, the next model, for, you know, with the features of 10-bit and autofocus all, and, you know, 50p, 60p, all this sort of stuff. Been, every time that Sony are going to announce a camera, you're like, is it? Is it? Is this it? Is, is this it the one? Be, it and it isn't. One, yeah. And it's been like that for the past two or three years. It's, it's, it's been amazing to shoot with it for the past you know, six, seven weeks. And it's been painful not being able to tell people. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's just like, I just want to just, 
I just wanted to tell everybody, like, it is amazing. And, yeah, and I, I think also about your content, it's quite emotional. When I looked at it, like, mm. it reminds me, like, of your, your famous video on IC uh, about the Alpha 7S. Uh, yeah. Was it important for you to do, to do this uh, particular content to test this camera? Yeah, so um, when I, the A7S first came out, um, the launch video that you guys made was beautiful fishing in, I think it was in Scotland, and it, it was shot in low light, but there was nothing for reference of what it was actually like to the eye. So I just had an idea, and this was in 2014, to go to somewhere like Brighton Beach is where I went, and to do the, this comparison of like what the eye could see, which was uh, 800 ISO, and then what the A7S could see, and I had these hard cuts. And it, and it really showed people that you, it was basically doing um, night for day filming yeah. outside, which you don't do. You can do it indoors and sets and stuff, but not, not outdoors. It was crazy. And it wasn't really about wanting to do that. It was just to show how high you could go. For me, the A7S was always about being able to shoot in lower light conditions mm. without having to be wide open and having you know, a very shallow depth field that was hard to control. Mm. And so for this, what I want, the idea of going back and doing a follow-up to that um, just felt kind of right because I, you know, I had an idea of, because this camera is not just a low-light beast. It's way more than that. The A7S was, and the A7S Mark II, uh, the strongest part of it was the fact that it was incredibly good at high ISOs. This camera is amazing in normal light. So I, I really wanted to show 24 hours on the same beach in the same place and instead of having these hard cuts of, you know, from darkness to light, I, wanted mm. to, I had a lot of match cuts of the same sh lined up shots yeah. to show from cutting from daytime to nighttime and then back to daytime and to have this non-linear narrative of 24 hours on this iconic beach. In slow motion. Yeah, it, was, it, it felt like the place to go back to. I filmed there quite a few times, but I hadn't been there in two years. Yeah. And it was... It, it, and it's, it can be difficult to go to the same place and film and make it feel fresh. Yeah. But having that idea of the, the timeline, the mix-up timeline, and, these, and being very careful about these uh, match cuts. And, it was, and it's, you know, it's not that easy to do, but as long as you find a position that is fixed, like, uh, you know, don't just pick a point in the middle of the beach, because you're never going to find that again. Find something that is physically there, and then fix on a point in, of a distant object yeah. in a particular point. So when you do go, you're not going to stay there for 12 hours until the light changes. No, you, then go, you, you keep going back. And so you, you have a, So what I was doing was I was also um, taking a photo and then sending the photo to my phone. So then I went back at night, not only was in the right position, I was then looking at my photo and going, oh, yeah, almost a bit high, a bit that. And I knew that I could line it up because I was in the, physically the right point. And also, the other thing that would give it away would be any... I made sure that there was nothing too close mm -hmm. to me because that would also give it away. So it was all about the key parts when the distance. And, yeah, and, it, and it just sort of came together, really. Yeah. And also, there were moments that were much more spontaneous as mm -hmm. well. So I would get a shot that I liked, like there was a shot of um, a seagull. And then... I was doing some filming at night, and I saw a seagull perched there. And I went, I'm going to film that in the same, roughly the same position, in the hope that maybe I could do something with it. And it worked. Something. And it, it worked. worked. So I did. There's quite a few match cuts I didn't use because it, it would have been too too much. It was just finding the right amount. So yeah, I, I it was a joy to shoot. Um, yeah. And yeah, I was. It was my first time actually going out filming. Um, that was more than five minutes from my house yeah. in months. So it was, it was emotional in, in many also ways. very refreshing to be it, out and be shooting again. It was, so, yeah, yeah, it was really nice, yeah. And uh, yeah, very emotional indeed. And uh, I think also like it was quite like um, an experience for you as well, um, Olivier. Yep. Um, for, you, for the audience that, that doesn't know Olivier uh, yet, um, um, we're just going to jump to uh, a quick video. Um, just to introduce uh, both of them, and we are going to come back to Olivier. Zick.
One morning, one sunset, one life full of passion can take you wherever you need to go. I understood that dreams and imagination only are the right recipe for a happy, independent filmmaker life. Today, it's your turn to put your imagination in motion. I'm just going to carry on. Now we've seen like this content from ob obviously um, I'm Philip and uh, he just introduced. Where I'm just going to carry on to Olivier now. Olivier, hello. Hello. I'm um, sorry, we didn't have a proper introduction. We jumped straight to the, no to the content because I couldn't wait to show everyone. Um, um, what amazing shots um, you did with the Alpha 7S Mark III. Could you please just introduce yourself to the yeah, audience? Yeah, for sure. And, and the project, which is very peculiar because it's a testimony to filmmaker, if I understood well. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity to test uh, this, this amazing oh, camera. So my name is Olivier Schmidt. I'm a French filmmaker and uh, photographer based in France. And uh, uh, with this project, my main idea was to talk to filmmakers uh, who watch the video mm -hmm. and uh, to make a very um, personal project based on my own experience, doubts and, and fears with my with with our, our job. Mm -hmm. We all try to make a living of of our passion, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, that's that's that was a key point of the project to to make a, a real storytelling about the experiences of of people who watch the video and also add inside a lot of technical uh, parts and to make a, a very relevant uh, project, yeah. short movie. And so I, I try to integrate inside a lot of things like uh, AF, uh, rolling shutter, also um, a dynamic range, and f yeah, slow motion and things like that to make a very uh, helpful uh, project for, for everyone to see the yeah. technical part and also to have something more philosophic about our job. Uh, yeah. And I, 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 I hope and I saw the comments, so I think it works. I hope that people recognize a, their own story in the in the movie. Yeah, I so. think I think it was really touching to see. Like, obviously, like we are pointing the camera at a lot of topics in life. Um, we are rarely like talking about filmmaking in general, uh, independent filmmakers. What is the reality of being a freelancer? And I think you put that into light. Like, you are like to do corporate jobs, uh, yeah, sometimes corporate. like estate kind of videos, and then you jump the other uh, the other uh, another date like to like a sport event you need to shoot yeah. for another client. So I think you, you really did like a good Thank job you. at pushing the camera, but at the same time trying to depict that. I, I that could make a one hour, one hour movie to, 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 to try every aspect of yeah. our job, but yeah, interior design, sport, uh, also, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. That was very interesting to see, and I hope our audience uh, had the time to watch before um, this live stream. Um, and the content from both Olivier and Philip to see kind of like some real life examples on, on what the capabilities of this camera is. Um, obviously, one of the main points of this camera is the kind of like the 4K, uh, the video quality in general, because 4K is just 4K, is just a resolution. But mm. you have the frame range, the codex, you have the dynamic range you need to take into account, the rolling shutter, and etc. Um, and, and I'm quite curious, like in your experience shooting with the camera, um, for example, if I ask you, Philip, what was the main point, like you, if you had like to pick one thing you really liked about? It's, it's, there's so much I liked about the camera to just choose one is very difficult. The fact that it's 10-bit recording was absolutely essential to come to this camera because it's, it's the, the, we need it for shooting in the high dynamic range, we need it for grading, we need, it was absolutely essential. So having that was great. Having the 4K higher frame rates, having the option is great. I had no expectation that it was going to be as high as 120. Mm. Didn't expect that at all. Um, and for me, it's just an incredibly powerful video camera. And that is what was quite amazing. It's when I was, first time I was um, shown the camera and was going through the specs, everything that was said to me, I kept going, yeah, but it's going to be limited by a mm. crop, though, isn't it? And I went, no. Oh, but the autofocus isn't going to work in that mode, is it? I went, no, it's all, it's all working. Like, yeah. and, I, and I said, I don't understand. I didn't understand when the specs were read to me how, why it was so good. You know what I mean? It yeah. just felt, I'm so used to being disappointed mm -hmm. in 
something that's missing. It's like, oh, if only it did this, so it's so close. And it seemed to just tick almost every single box. Yeah, it's not 6K or 8K. What it is, is incredibly beautiful 4K. And it's, it does it so well. It's just some, one of the nicest 4Ks I've ever seen. So and I'm happy think, to yeah. wait. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, okay, what would have happened if they, if you guys had brought out it two years ago? It wouldn't have been the same yeah. camera. Mind you, you probably would have brought out the A7S IV now, which would be this camera. Mm. But it's, it has, you know, has it been worth the wait? Sort of. It's been a long wait. It is worth the wait in the fact that this camera is way better, mm. way better than I expected it to be. And that's the biggest surprise. It's, for me, it's just... I was just absolutely blown away by the specs and then even more blown away by actually using it yeah. and seeing That's a point. the huge improvements in every single aspect of the camera. And I think you also like, I mean, like in your content, you, you, you were jumping like from daylight to nighttime. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the main points, I guess for you was like kind of like image quality in, in kind of like very low light. I think we have some examples we can show um, um, to the audience um, mm. um, from your, your short movie. But. Yeah, this, is, this was for me to shoot and, and under street lights mm. at 100 frames per second, with just, you know, just that, that natural light in 4K with tracking, full tracking autofocus. I'm just touching the screen or, or a face would come up and that's who I would want. And it was just like, it was crazy to be able to do that. To be able to shoot 4K high frame rates in, in in that sort of lighting conditions was amazing for me. Mm. Uh, I was also very surprised that I wasn't getting any flickering because normally, because you do have to have your shutter speed higher when shooting high frame rates, and the lights clearly in Brighton they've spent some money on. So um, <laughs> they're, like they're, very, like, they're, they're not they're not really lights, nasty. Yeah, yeah so, they knew that you had a yeah because normally I yeah. would probably be limited to 50p yeah. if I was trying to shoot under that sort of lighting conditions at a hundredth of a second yeah. uh, shutter speed. But I was able. To, I, I tried it and thought, let's see what I get. And I was like, they, I saw like tiny flickering in from like a shop in the distance. I'm like, great, this is fine. I was very, very, very surprised at how good that was. I mean, the other thing about the camera is the fact that, which is actually a really cool thing, is before, if you wanted to go even higher than that into the NTSC frame rate modes, mm -hmm. which is 120p, you couldn't do it with the same card. Yeah. You switch in and it said, you need to Restart format it. the card or switch. Yeah. yeah, and the format would come up in like, Never press it. Now you can have both modes on the actual same card. And it's, it's, that's just really nice. So you, if you want to shoot 60p, you want to shoot 120p, and in HD you want to shoot 240 frames, which is because it's 200 for PAL, yeah. you can. The only tiny caveat is if you're in an NTSC mode and you have some PAL clips on there, you can't play them back. It shows you the thumbnail. You just can't play them back until you go back into PAL mode, which is mm. no big deal. Having the ability to shoot and not you know, some, often, you know, we're in power land and we go, oh, those NTSC guys get an extra, you know, 20 frames per second out of their stuff. Yeah. We can now as well. And I think that's great. I think, I think it's a very, very good point. Like being able in low light to, to, to show that at these high frame rates, being able like to rely on the camera. Um, as you mentioned, obviously, like this is why it took us so long. Like you have mm. to design like a really good sensor and a really good processor to be outputting this kind of like, um, amazing like video capabilities. Mm. Um, apart from the low light, kind of like high frame rate 4K, I think like you also have like um, um, some favorite features, like more about, about dynamic. Like yeah, this. dynamic just surprised me uh, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, so I, I try to illustrate so dynamic in, in very specific situations that are relevant, like interior design. When you shot interior design, uh, and, I, and I saw some footage, uh, you, you always knew, know that you will have probably a, an issue with mm. dark inside and very bright clouds or just bright windows. And so the team and I were, were a bit shocked to see how much details we had in the clouds. Mm. Uh, you, you will you see, see on the, on yeah, the you will right see now. on the screen right now. That's when when uh, when we switch uh, soon inside. Just watch the windows and how many details we have. But you're shooting uh, S log three. Yeah. Uh, both S log two and S log three. But we couldn't uh, shoot S log three for the before maximum because dynamic. it was eight bit. But now it's yeah. ten bit. We can, and that's but amazing. Uh, yeah, just I, I do prefer to shoot some 
shots in S log two because I, I, I have my habits yeah. uh, in post production with S log two. But yes, uh, you can see that the, the dynamic was crazy. Also in the mountains, uh, mm -hmm. we did a, a hike in the mountains, and and you can see the clouds. Mm -hmm. When you see very bright clouds, usually when you're outside with your main actor in the shadow, you know that you, have to you, you will, yeah, you have to compromise. Either your part, yeah, the yeah, highlights yeah. and the, the landscape or your actor, but you can't do both. Yeah. Usually, yeah. Um, yeah, it's easy with the blue sky, but uh, you know, <laughs> I don't like blue skies. Blue skies are boring. They're boring. We want a bit of, you know, <laughs> apart from continuous light, which is can be a nightmare. Yeah, but yeah, it's, but it is, yeah, having clouds in there and be able to those to not uh, be clipped. Yeah. Is is really nice. Maybe yeah. we can we can maybe show the the yeah, hiking part uh, during the the, the, the hiking. Up. So we can see here that you have all details. You can see on the graph below uh, that's all the clouds in the, in the yeah. very bright mm. white parts, especially on this one. Yeah. You have details everywhere. You can you can just grade it and, and thanks to ten bit find you want find a information. Sometimes gimbal, sometimes. Um, is that your go? Gru. A gru. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's that? A kind oh, of like a um, the mechanic, the, the uh, mechanic arm. Uh, oh, a, gib, a, 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 um, a jib. A jib, a jib yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you hiked up there with a jib. We hike with oh, a yeah. jib. I hope, you, I hope you had help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just you. We were six people. We oh, were six yeah. people. It was, I was yeah. on my own. Thanks to my team. <laughs> um, Lucky you. So that's what's crazy for this kind of stuff. And I also had example. Uh, I, I tried the dynamic range during uh, with with slow motion in in 100p and yeah. it works as well as in 25p. That's it. So so just the autofocus, the dynamic range, it doesn't matter. This is yeah, same yeah, yeah. within within the high after, frame after range. After one yeah. hour shooting, I just knew that I can trust yeah. the camera for for every single shot yeah. in any situation. Yeah. Yeah. You just feel feel free to shot yeah. and just. You know that's you, that's the technique part is good. Yeah. Just have to to focus on your framing, on your actors, on your subjects, on your landscape, mm. and and that's it. And that that's the main part. You just focus on the creativity and the technical part. Sony <laughs> yeah. works on it. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we've got our crew like telling us. Uh, obviously, we're still having like issue with this audio sync. Um, don't tune out. We are just going to stop the stream for a quick moment and restart it um, to give you the opportunity to have a good audio right now. So we're just going to be out for um, one or t uh, 20 seconds and just come back live. Hello again. Uh, thank you for staying with us. Uh, hopefully now it's working properly and you can have like the best experience uh, watching this webinar. Um, we are just Mentioning obviously dynamic range, um, Olivier. Uh, I yeah. think also like uh, shooting action pack, like you know, like kind of like sequences and etc. Uh, put any sensor on the market, regardless of the camera, um, 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 in terms of rolling shutter. And obviously, this is really important for a lot of, um, of filmmakers out there. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience um, shooting with this camera? How the rolling shutter was kind of like improved, and yep. what are the actual benefit like when you're shooting? So I, I try to illustrate rolling shutter because it's a big it's a big part for some people. I guess mm. it's it's uh, it's something complicated for the processor to to manage with such a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to try to illustrate this in two ways, and mainly with a cable move following uh, a mountain biker. Mm -hmm. uh, so I put the camera on the cable, uh, a wire, a wire movement, and uh, and just. To, to, to illustrate this, and you can see on the on the image, on the on the screen that the rolling shutter is just is just amazing. Yeah, you don't crazy. you don't see it's any good, yeah, rolling then. shutters, so the trees are, are very straight, and, and and that was very very You're helpful for this kind of shot. Brave man putting that on a cable cam. Yeah, I was at the, the limits <laughs> of uh, <laughs> the well, maximum. Yeah, at yeah, least yeah. it's not your camera, so. And and, yeah. I ask, <laughs> and my well, we obviously <laughs> don't recommend to go above. Um, the accredited weight, but um, yeah. obviously, um, but that is that is ridiculous because normally those those trees would be yeah would yeah, be yeah completely yeah. like that would, bent. Yeah. Yeah, you, you would not get that sort of thing because yeah. I, I did some rolling shutter tests for my review and I was like that's crazy, I mean it's you know it's one of these things that we 
learned to put up with mm -hmm. as one of the downsides to... Usually, sort of, yes. Yeah, and it's like, that's great. I mean, for me, it's just it's such a huge difference on shoots because I, I do a lot of handheld shooting for my documentary filming. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, you know, it's the handheld, it's just, it's not just fast moving. It's about just being handheld and it not being wobbly. It's yeah. there. It looks so much better to have that massive improvement in, in, in the rolling shutter, shutter artifacts. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, we're always saying, oh, wish they could put the global shutter in, but global <laughs> shutter has lots of downsides. Mm. Um, CMOS sensors are much more sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the best rolling shutter artifact. It looks like performs. a Yeah, it looks like a, a, a really good, really good video camera, a high-end video camera, which that's the equivalent that I've actually seen. Mm. And it was, I didn't know it was going to be that good. Yeah. When I was told, it was better, but it's until you try these things. Yeah, until you Everything is a yeah. spec, yeah. and until you try it, it, it's like, okay, I'm sure it's better, right. I bet it's, instead of being like that, it's really like that. <laughs> yeah. It could but be it, artistic. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> like, you know, end up shooting everything as a Dutch angle just to compensate for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, yeah, that's a very good point. Like, we've been talking about, obviously, these, um, these kind of, like, technologies, and as I introduced in, in the beginning, like, um, having, like, a new sensor and a new processor, like, really helps with these kind of, like, real, real benefits. Mm. Um, I would like now for, for our audience, because obviously we are getting like very technical, but I would like uh, our audience to have like um, um, some explanation from Ben in terms of like the techni technical um, uh, aspect of it, um, how that works out together, and actually kind of like having also like some sort of like low light um, um, quick demonstration. Because I think like obviously we're talking about it, you are professional filmmakers, um, but just to see like in life, like actually the, the, the low light performance of this camera being amazing and retaining like obviously the the colors and the tones of, of your subject in the frame. So now I'm just going to hand over to Ben. Ben, um, if, if you may explain a little bit more the sensor and, uh, and the process and how they, they impact on the video uh, image quality. Cool. Thank you, Pierre. So you've heard a lot from Philippe and Olivier already. And a lot of what they've been able to do is because we really have revolutionized the camera, our Alpha 7S Mark III, yeah, well. it might look very similar to our other cameras. It might sound very similar if you listen to it having a 12 megapixel full frame sensor. It sounds a little bit like the predecessor. But from the ground up, the insides of this camera and some of the outsides as well have been significantly changed from its predecessor. It's using a 12 megapixel Exmor R full frame sensor. So that's a backside illumination sensor. That will give it even better low light quality. It's the first time we've actually used a real illuminated structure on a 12 megapixel full frame sensor. So already having those really large pixels giving it the great ISO capability to shoot in low light is further enhanced. And on top of that, we're using special copper wiring which gives really quick data throughput. That combines together with our Bions XR processor. So as we've mentioned, that's our brand new processor which is eight times quicker than the current Bions X. And those two things working together, almost like the brain and the heart of the camera, really make everything possible on there. You heard Philip talking before about wondering where's the limitation, what's not going to work. But because we've really tried to maximize the capability of both those things, the sensor and the processor, it helps the camera deliver amazing 4K quality. Now, on top of being able to shoot, like I say, at very quick frame rates, so 4K 100p or 4K 120p. Of course, our S series is very famous for being able to shoot in low light. And that means that not only can this shoot very well in low lights like you'd find with the Alpha 7S Mark II, but it goes beyond that and the performance is even better. So to give you an idea of, of what that kind of looked like, it's just in a quick live demo, you've already seen some great low light footage in the videos already. Um, I just have a scene set up in front of me here again with a little bit of candlelight. What we're going to do is we're going to dim the lights here in the room. Um, I'm gonna start off at a low sensitivity and then uh, you're gonna see as we ramp up the differences that the camera can make to what we can see. So now as we turn off the lights uh, in front of our scene here, you'll be able to see, like I say, this is literally like I have a light on me here. We're blocking the light showing onto the scene and I can see the candle here, but I pretty much can't see anyone else. It's giving you a very fair representation of exactly what we can see. So now, um, what we're gonna show you is a picture in picture where I'm gonna bring up the menu on the full size of the screen and you're gonna be able to see lots of things coming up between there. So now, 
I've just got my ISO set onto the rear of the camera. You can see we're at ISO 100, we're at f2.8, a hundredth of a second. I'm going to start ramping up here, and again, those large pixels which are back illuminated, as we mentioned, on the Alpha 7 s Mark III, you see the scene actually coming to life here. And this is beyond already what I can see with my eye. You get a representation in that bottom left-hand corner of the light conditions in the room. As we ramp it up further and further, we're up to 51,200 ISO, and already we're getting quite a normal exposure in the scene. As we go up even further, you can see even the candle here is being overexposed, and the rest of the scene very, very well exposed with good colors. And on top of that, of course, just for fun, we can overexpose it, we can go right up to your crazy 409,600 ISO. And that is the amazing capability of the Alpha 7 S Mark III. It can see things in front of me that I can't physically see myself, but it's giving you even better quality than our Alpha 7 S Mark II. And of course, with that new processor, new image sensor in there, great quality in terms of low light capability combined with high frame rates. And as we mentioned as well, minimum rolling shutter in there on top of it all. As I bring it back down, of course, you can leave the camera straight back in ISO Auto if you like, as well as being able to set it manually and go throughout the range as well. So, so I'll pass back over uh, to Pierrick and we will uh, have a look at what else the camera has got to offer. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think it's quite amazing to see um, this kind of like um, uh, low light capabilities in life because usually we see like beautiful content like from obviously professionals and they know what they're doing and they know how to treat the footage but straight out the camera um, through an HDMI feed like it's I think it's really convincing to see how the color were retained at crazy high 100,000 ISO, 200,000 uh, ISOs. Um, apart from the video quality I think one of the important things I knew um, I, you probably have like um, your own experience of it, but I think one of the main things we've been establishing with Sony Alpha cameras, also RX cameras um, um, in our lineup is obviously we are trying to constantly um, kind of like uh, make our autofocus system more reliable. And it's been true for self photography, but I believe with this camera, uh, it's more and more relevant for videographers to rely on, on autofocus and not think so much that manual focus is the only way to go. And I think you both had like this experience during these, uh, both of your shoots, like um, the usage of autofocus for certain scenes and et cetera. Um, and if I'm handing over to you, uh, Philip, what, what was your experience of autofocus during um, this particular shoot? Yeah, so I mean, I've been ex experimenting with autofocus for a number of years as it's been getting better and better and using it for certain types of filming. I think the sort of for interviews, I, I've been using it the most, but what we get, we've got now with this, the new camera is really important for me is the touch tracking. Now we have eye autofocus, that's amazing and all that sort of stuff, but the touch tracking on the LCD screen meant I could just pick what I wanted to be in focus, it would put a box around it, and then it would stay on that, it would stick on that. And you look, the, I think it was the, the two videos that I made, the paddleboard one was 100% shot in autofocus. There was a comment on YouTube saying, um, really impressed with your rack focusing, your focus rack, especially on, you know, on, a, on a Sony stills lens. I'm like, 100% autofocus. Yeah, it wasn't me. That. We are seeing yeah. that on the screen so, right yeah. now. So here, I was just literally saying, okay, I'm gonna, so Julian's actually on my paddleboard, not there, but he's coming up next. And the settings are incredibly important. So your, your sensitivity is and what your speed of your motor is. So on this, the shot coming up here, I got my sensitivity really low, and because I pressed uh, Julian on the paddleboard, but he would have been, he, as, as he goes behind other people, what would have happened is it would revert onto the, the, the biggest thing in the frame. So when you have a low sensitivity, it's the same if, I, if say you're filming somebody in a crowd, and you know, you've got a presenter there, and there's people walking in front and stuff, or you, maybe it's a build, whatever it is, you have it on, locked on or one up from that, and it won't be distracted. But it's no good if you have somebody coming towards you, you then need to up the speed. And that's why understanding the settings of the camera and how they work are essential to getting the best out of autofocus. It's not a, a button you just press and go, oh, it's all gonna be perfect. With stills, it's much easier because it's, it's just a frame. But for video, it needs to be smooth, it needs to be accurate, it needs to be what we want it to be. And so I have, in the function menu, for example, I have 
the tracking sensitivity and the speed um, as a quick access. So I can quickly change what I need it to be. Yeah. And the most common thing that I would actually change is the actual speed. So, and it is actually sometimes lens dependent. Some lenses are faster than oh, others. Yeah. So I shot a lot in Brighton with the 200 to 200 to 600. 600. Yeah. And it's got a, a slightly slower motor than say my 70 to 200. And so I, when I was trying to get somebody coming towards me, I was, I increased, I pressed, I got a shortcut button and I just pressed that and touch screen, whoop, upped my speed by two, because we now have uh, seven steps mm -hmm. for speed and five steps for the sensitivity. And before it was not on the A7S2, but on the A7 III and the A7 uh, Armour, A7 R4, there's so many cameras. It was <laughs> responsive and standard. Mm -hmm. And it was um, slow, medium, fast for speed. So now we have much more fine control mm -hmm. and quick access to it is essential to getting the best out of your autofocus. And the most important thing I recommend for everybody if you're gonna use autofocus is make sure you have a shortcut button that is really naturally where your thumb will be, wherever it is, which is focus hold off or turn it off. So as you, somebody's coming towards you and they about to exit the frame, you press focus hold and that they exit the frame. Otherwise it will revert onto the background. Mm. Yeah. So it's taking control of when you want that. There's always also manual focus is something I use all the time. And what's really nice as well is you can be in full manual focus mode um, and, and have that autofocus button, press it, and it will go on to what you want, and, you, and then you back in, you let go, and then you back into manual focus. So having that just to get that thing. You know, because I, you know, I wear glasses and stuff and making sure that, you know, I use a monitor, um, so I've got a nice big screen. And even then I'm like, is that in focus? When I'm doing manual focus, is that in focus? And you, the common thing that I've done in the past um, is with manual focus shooting, is I'm, I'm filming, I'm filming, I'm like, I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm like, is that in focus? And I turn and go, oh yeah, it was. And so, I have to go, so I just lost it briefly. Whereas I know, I press it, and I know after all of this testing and testing and testing, that it is. And it's the great thing, what autofocus is, is it's a tool that makes things easier, helps easier. you shoot quicker, helps yeah. you shoot. Everything should be about making your life easier so you can concentrate on your subject. And I was able to just like, I want that to be in focus, I want that to be in focus. And you can do it for focus racks as well. You can set the different speeds for that. That's another use of the speed. And you can get some nice ramped poor focuses. All of this sort of stuff. It's definitely a time for manual focus, without question. And I, I, I still would say, normally I would use manual focus most of the time. It's just on these shoots. It made no sense at all for me to shoot manual focus because it yeah. just worked so well. Yeah. And even when I was on the um, when I was shooting on the paddleboard, I was on a boat, and I was actually shooting through the EVF. And um, you know, this is actually this is this is the A7 R4. And you know, obviously, if you've got up to your eye, then you're not going to have access to your screen. Mm. But you can set it up as a as a touchpad, yeah. and you can set up to be the whole thing or just quarters. So I actually have it set to actually the top, top right I have it set to. So, you know, my thumb, so it's up there to my eye and my thumb is just moving the cursor around yeah. and then letting go of when I've got my subject. And it, that's how I was shooting on that. Um, I use a view, I, an EVF viewfinder is essential. Yeah. It's, a, it's way bigger in your eye when you're filming. This is, a, the screen is great on the A7S, even it's small. Yeah. You have an EVF up to your eye, and it's it's and huge. It's bigger, huge. Yeah. It's immersive. You're part of the image. It gives you more stability, and of course, when it's bright, you can really see clearly, and you're not losing any of the functionality. But I was on that boat. I was looking through the EVF. I was shooting on the end of a 400 millimeter lens wow. on a boat with the IS um, going the act, an active stabilization. No, it didn't even have active stabilization because I was shooting in ProRes raw beta, so they didn't have that. Mm. So I was trying to keep as steady as possible, and it worked out, I was resting on a bag, and it worked out really well. For some, yeah. I mean, if you look at my rushes, it didn't work out well for all of it. You know, yeah, the yeah, stuff yeah. you see is the steady stuff, because what would happen when you're on a boat on the river, um, a boat goes past and you're boom, 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 and you're like, oh, that's such a great shot. And yeah. I'm like, I hope I've got, 
I hope I've got long enough on that. So I did shoot everything as 50p. Most of it play, is playing back as normal speed, mm -hmm. but I shot at 50p just in case. I Can't only roll, got, yeah. yeah, so I had, oh, I had you know, yeah. if I rolled, for, if I got two seconds of smoothness, I had a four second shot yeah, that I could yeah. use. So, you know, the downside is your, your shutter speed isn't quite as perfect motion blur wise, but it's, it was absolutely fine. And it was, yeah, it's enough. And I just absolutely, I was so happy with what I got out of that. It was the perfect day. And it was all, you know, this was only shot like a week and a bit ago, this, this um, second video. Mm. And, you know, you, planning a video, planning anything outdoors in England is a gamble. Yeah. I mean, you were telling me what's, what's plan B. I'm like, I haven't got one. Yeah. <laughs> there is no plan. Outdoors, There's though. no plan B. It's fine. It, we're gonna, I've looked at the weather. A 20% chance that we're going to have a 10% chance of good weather. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, you just have to hope. Because with England, there's no point in having a look at long-range forecasts because you don't need to tell the day before, really. And this is where, like, you know, <laughs> you need that reliable autofocus because you don't get that yeah. many opportunities to shoot this kind of, like, content. What's interesting about the autofocus is it works really well even at the very high ISOs, yeah. which really surprised me. I expected it to be in terrible no light, in no light. light. I expected yeah. it to be completely useless, but it was actually yeah. working so well. I mean, it was... It was really crazy. I was like, yeah. I was at, I, at, the highest I shot in the Brighton video that I used was 100 and whatever, 1,000 ISO. And it worked. The autofocus worked. Mm. And I was really not expecting it to at all. Um, I didn't need to go higher than that. Well, I, I could have gone higher than that, but it would have been obviously too noisy in those sort of situations. I just was surprised. I expected to have to go into manual focus. And that would mean using EVF, which is fine when you're shooting handheld, but on a tripod, it's a bit awkward because you've got, you know, it's not, you've got to get your tripod the right height for the shot. And so you're like bending over, trying to look through. And it was great. It was, I was surprised at how accurate and, and good it was. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... Same, same for me. Yeah. I, I try the autofocus in, 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 in a room, in a, in a house, and, uh, and with my main actor, just in front of the camera, so and after he turned back, mm -hmm. so I had him in, in profile, and then uh, he was completely reversed from the camera, and the, I asked I asked me I asked him sorry to to look on the right sometimes just to see if if the IF just catch him yeah. catch his eyes, uh, and uh, you can see on the footage on the footage that he is always perfectly perfectly mm. fine perfectly in focus yeah. uh, during all the, the sequence. And, and to rely to the, the, mm. the, 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 AF, the yeah. AF, sorry, is very important. And, uh, and usually I would use a, a fo focus puller for this mm. kind of, uh, of movement. And, but, but with this kind of lenses, with yeah. photo lens, uh, it's, you, you, it's, it's hard, hard yeah. to, to, yeah. to use a puller. And uh, so usually I, I would use a cine lens and, uh, and but with this IF and uh, autofocus yes. system, you yeah, can rely. Yeah, make it easier to yeah. do sequences and like following like your actor and etc. I was really impressed that the autofocus was working so brilliantly in in S Log three mode, because mm. normally I found in, you in most contrast. cameras you <laughs> need contrast yeah. for the autofocus because it uses contrast and phase detection and phase to get detection, it. Yeah. So the, the 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 accuracy is contrast and the speed is phase detection. So it needs both, and there's little contrast when you're shooting an S log three, mm. and it didn't make any difference because yeah. you're normally pushing the exposure on S log three. You generally you push it up by a couple of stops to to you know to make sure that your sh your your shadows are yeah. not noisy, mm. and also holding your highlights, and that often does make I all the focus tends to work, but the face tracking eye tracking can sometimes suffer. Yep had no issues. It was exactly the same as if I was shooting in a contrasted profile, yeah. which was a very nice surprise. A very good surprise. I yeah. was expecting to go, this isn't working. I'm going to have to go into a cine profile, exactly. but it was great. I'm um, coming back to um, Olivier. Obviously, the, we were just mentioning real-time tracking with um, Philip and how it was really helpful for the, the paddleboarding. Uh, in your experience, like having real-time AF, especially in low light, in those sequences following your actor was quite quite crucial um, for yeah, these yeah. um, 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 short scenes. Um, can you tell us more about like your experience not using this kind of like uh, manual focus and relying only on the AF for these yeah, sequences? Yeah, I, I took with me uh, a, a rack focus system, and, and but I contrast myself to not use it, mm -hmm. to really rely to to the, the camera. 
and but just for my security, I took my my, my rack focus system, and I didn't didn't open it during the two weeks of production. Oh, I, I didn't yeah. need it. So t the fact that you can choose the speed and sensitivity sensitivity is is crucial because. I tried the uh, autofocus on very smooth movements, so I needed him to it to be uh, very smooth when when my my actor main actor just move a little bit. I don't want the focus to to move quickly with, with him at at this moment particular moment because if it moves so quickly, mm. uh, you will have some some, some defocus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, it's yeah. yeah, your shot is, your shot's unusable. You will yeah, you will it. not use it because yeah. you can see in 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 the bokeh on the background that it's moving a lot when yeah. you have a, a small light in in, in yeah. on the blur. So you want it to stick, but not to kind of like yeah, just in, in just manual time. focus. You'd you'd be you'd, if you lost it a little bit, you'd be fine with it. That's yeah, because it's, it's still it's cinematic. Natural. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's natural. Yeah, yeah. We expect that. It's natural. So and for. For other purpose, uh, yeah. I put it in very sensitive, very, sp very, very speed. Yeah, I think we've got a clip of that. If we can, um, Brenda, uh, I think it's about the entry scene of your of your. Yes. Yeah, so the entry scene, maybe we we will see it soon. Is is the first scene, uh, the second scene of of, uh, yes, this one. So that's the original file. It's a cine profile. It's not a log mm. profile due yeah. to to noise in in the dark and shadow parts. And I ask my my actor to look at on the right sometimes, like just right now. And at this moment, you you have to trust me. The the IF system just catch the eye each time he look on, at the right. And mm. and so usually for this kind of of shot, you you need a rack system. That is yeah. And. Uh, Everything was very yeah. fluid and very smooth, mm -hmm. and I have another example. So for yeah, for sports, we, we can run that example of the I think the parachuter, isn't it? So no, oh, this is yeah. Yeah. on the ground. So that's the IF system uh, record with the Atomos, and uh, you can see that it stick on on the face. On the eye, even, even with glasses. Yeah, even uh, with glasses or yeah. several faces yeah, that yeah, yeah. you can just like stick onto That's uh, your main character and just not really uh, worried. And this one is quite a good example. Yeah, well. because it was it's very shaky. I, I don't remember if I use any of this mm. part of sequence, but you can see that yeah, yeah, the the IF just catch it, catch him. Even on the on the side of the on frame, the side, which is yeah. quite it's quite it's quite important. So um, you've got to keep that speed down, haven't you? And this one, like, so you can see yeah. that the paraglider is always in focus. But that with was that, in very that, sensitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, you've got to be careful when you're filming autofocus. That speed is the one that's... They both, they're both can ruin your shots if you've got the wrong settings. But almost never have I needed to be at the fastest speed. Because that's where you can have the most unnatural yeah. looking Look, things. It looks too, it looks too artificial, like yeah. too quick. It's what it is. It basically if you because it there is contrast being used. So if you do have brighter backgrounds, for mm. example, it can get it can lose tracking occasionally if it's like a really bright background. Yeah. So if you have that sp sensitivity is good to have high the natural, so it doesn't catch up. But if you keep, it's all, getting that right balance. In that sort of situation, I would probably bring my sensitive down a little bit, but yeah. bring my speed right down to the, almost slow, depending on the lens. Right, right, so yeah. if it does lose focus, it doesn't jump onto the background, yeah, which is what will happen mm. if you have it set to fast, which of course is gonna completely ruin your shot. Yeah. As amazing as the, the face tracking and eye tracking is, if you have very, very difficult lighting, it can occasionally get distracted. And that's, it, that's, you know, I know people who have tried autofocus and said, oh, it does this. And I'm like, you just got your settings wrong. You need to understand your settings. Yeah. I, you know, with trust, the FX9, trust, yeah. I, I spent about three, two or three weeks of testing and testing and testing to truly get the perfect settings. Yeah. And in my six, or six weeks or so with this camera, um, they're very similar to the FX9, and so I, if it were like a very natural transition, yeah. and to be able to quickly get Change them, it. yeah, it's great. And the great thing about the Sony lenses is they're most mostly very similar speed motors, 
And that is important. If you're using third-party lenses, sometimes your motors could be slower. And so therefore, you need, to un you need to know that motor's gonna be slower than that one there. But I've really, and also quiet, that is incredibly mm. important as well. When you're recording sound, you don't. When I was, um, I remember doing something on camera and I, I had the audio on the, on the top mic, thinking, I'm pretty close, it's gonna be fine. And it was an autofocus and it, was, um, it wasn't a Sony camera. And some, somebody wrote in the comments, like, is that your cat purring on you? I'm like, <laughs> no, that's the autofocus motor keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Because I was stupidly shooting at like 1.4. And if you're shooting at 1.4 close up to a lens, every tiny bit of movement is going to make that motor move. move. Yeah. So, and that's also something you've got to be very careful about with using autofocus, is your lens breathing. So if you are going to be shooting at stupidly wide open, and you are going to be that close to a subject where every tiny, where your depth of field is so small, every bit of movement's good. You are going to, if your lens That'd does breathe, yeah. you are going to see things which aren't as attractive. Yeah. So you need to understand your lenses. You need to, you know, it's not, whilst you can shoot wide open on, and the old focus will stick on it, you don't always want to because there, it will show more issues, especially if you have any like bokeh circles and stuff like that, through, those yeah. are the things that give it away. If you have a, nice, a flat, ordinary background, it's okay. But it's when you have like lights in the background, you can see it, you can see it going, of, yeah, because yeah. it's every time it slightly yeah. changes. And that's, that's really not a downside of the camera, it's a byproduct of lenses and it's and optics. Stuff. Yeah. 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 It's optics, yeah. yeah. But I, I think like you, you both like really like enjoy that kind of like that being able like to customize a little bit more like hmm. your, your, your AF settings. Um, um, I'm just going to end over to Ben because like, I'm not really sure like, everyone in the audience like, understand what settings we're talking about. So it'd be great for, for Ben to explain a little bit further where you can find these, uh, maybe do some quick demo um, um, for, for the audience to completely understand what we are talking about, um, about the autofocus system. So with the Alpha 7 s Mark III, um, as we've mentioned, you get this brand new autofocus system, a massive step up from anybody using the s Mark II, but combining the phase detection built into the image sensor along with our Bion's XR processor, it gives us really, really good focus uh, being able to do that, like I say, with the real-time tacking, the real-time uh, eye autofocus. And what Phil was talking a lot about there was the speed and sensitivity settings. So just to show you through those and what exactly they are, I'm gonna bring you into the camera menu here so you can see exactly what you're gonna to need to be changing. So here you can see that on the menu, you have now a tab dedicated to autofocus and manual focus, so everything in one spot. Um, of course, like I said, we might have a chance to talk about the full menu later, but we're in movie mode on the camera and you can see everything here is related to movies and that includes the movie autofocus. And of course you can see that movie symbol just beneath the AF, MF uh, logo there. If you were in a stills mode, you would see a still image logo there. So here you know already this is relating to your movie autofocus. When we go into here, you can see, like I say, we have on our first option there, autofocus transition speed and subject shift sensitivity. Now at the moment, we've got these set up right at the top. So the autofocus transition speed, after the camera's decided to change focus, how quickly is it going to change focus? And of course, you can change these settings with the touchscreen. You can put custom button to access these very quickly, or you can put them into your uh, FN menu, your function menu. That is very easily accessible and lots of different options on there. The second setting we saw within there as well was the autofocus subject shift sensitivity. And again, this one goes from locked on down at one all the way up to very responsive up at five. Now, just to give you an idea of some of the differences between those, um, I'm just gonna move the focus point around the screen. Now, at the moment, don't forget, with these settings, we're on seven, very fast autofocus transition speed. We're on five, the top responsive, in terms of the subject shift sensitivity. So that subject shift sensitivity is talking about when it decides, okay, there's interference here in the focus point and I wanna shift straight onto this other subject. So to give you an idea, of course, this can work in terms of if a subject comes into your focus area. I'm just gonna move the focus point along from subject to subject. You can see it here on our beautiful Mavica. I'm just gonna move the focus point over to the flowers on the background and you can see very quickly it changes. That's of course deciding to change very quickly with the shift sensitivity, but also the speed of that transition of focus is very quick. I'll move it back onto our beautiful Mavica at the front and you can see it's focusing very quickly between the subjects here. Now, as Philip mentioned, you really have the options to customize this as you want. So if we, for example, leave the shift sensitivity very responsive, we can have a much 
slower, smoother change of focus between the subjects. And now I'm going to bring it right the way down to one. Okay, so we're one on our transition speed, but we're still up on that number five in terms of the subject shift sensitivity. So now when I move the focus point over onto the Mavica, it decides to change, but it is that slower, smoother update of the focus. And again, as I move it all the way back onto the flowers again, again, it decides to change, but that process of starting and ending the focus change is a lot slower and smoother. Of course, like I say, you can experiment to what suits your situation. So again, in here, I might decide to put the subject shift sensitivity all the way down to locked on. Let's uh, emphasize it a little bit more by changing the transition speed right the way to the top. So what we're going to see now is that if I maybe move my hand in front of the focus point here, you don't see the focus actually changing onto my hand. And that's because we're telling it to stay really locked on to the subject that's behind there. And you can see, even though I'm really getting my hand right in front of that focus point, we're making sure that it's actually really concentrating on that subject to the back. And it'll take a lot of interference for that to actually change its focus. But of course, that can be exceptionally useful if there is somebody that you really want to focus on. There could be other objects coming in front, which could be distracting. But if you are wanting to change it, just like we had before, just as a reminder, this is with the quick subject uh, shift sensitivity. Putting my hand in front, you can see it focuses straight on. And putting that out, again, moving it away, and it focuses straight back. So you can see exactly how that works, and hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into what you're seeing there. I'll pass back now onto Pierre-Ric. I think that, that was really clear, like how you can like fiddle around your AF settings depending on what you're shooting, what looks you're going for, um, what types of subjects as well um, you're shooting. And I think um, both filmmakers like illustrated that depending on, on their shoot requirements. I think one of the main things, obviously, video image quality and etc. is kind of like the quality of the camera. But the, the other part of like um, what was um, um, the kind of like the objective for this camera is to be also flexible. Uh, the new ways of shooting video, especially for freelancers being able to to be flexible to go on one shoot to another shoot, which you illustrate perfectly in your in your content, I think, Olivier, uh, being able like to do an interview and the next day like shooting sports and etc. Um, requires something that is um, um, very reliable, can be operated very quickly. So you don't really have like to really think about the technology aspect of your job, but more about the creative aspects. Um, this new body is obviously from the Alpha 7S Mark II, a complete kind of like redesign because everything is new um, on this body. Um, I think like you had like quite some strong like feelings about it, like kind of like being quite happy with this kind of like new layout of the button, the new screens and etc. Can you tell us a little yeah, bit more, Olivier? Screen, about... screen, finally. Yeah, finally. So yeah. finally, we can just just flip the screen and and take selfies. But it's uh, I use this this swivel screen not only for mm -hmm. selfies, and uh, and I, I use it for three specific use. Uh, so the first one, maybe we can show to, to the audience uh, the, um, the images. I, I use it for the selfie mode, basically, mm -hmm. for, for my main actor uh, on, 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 on the sky doing paragliding. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I use it uh, from below for mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. And so I put the, the camera on the ground. For taking picture for Instagram in, in selfie, but just do you do that a lot? To, to use do you post a lot of selfies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We've, I just bought this camera for that. Yeah. <laughs> but so it was very useful. So thank you for, for yeah. this feature. Uh, uh, we, we need it, and just for basic things like if you want to to shoot things on the ground, you just flip the screen, put your camera. The uh, framing makes it like yeah. it's a lot easier, like to frame your shots and etc. And you can be a bit more creative because like you're not like shooting like blindly and then just oh, like oh, suddenly people. like I really hope I'm in focus. I really hope I've got the right framing and etc. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. Quite a lot of people really do associate a flip out screen for vlogging, just yeah. vlogging, yeah. and it's not. It's about 
it's about it's useful for it's a useful, lot of purpose. It's about getting yeah, it's being able to see what you're doing in awkward positions. Yeah, yeah. you're always filming in awkward positions to get really interesting different angles. Yeah. yeah, where you know normally, I mean, the worst type of screen is one that doesn't move at all, which is a nightmare. And then uh, the flip, the, the, the tiltings are great mm -hmm. as long as you're behind the camera. And as soon as you're off axis, it's hard to see. And you have to use a monitor. Yeah. So the fact you can get away with that using a monitor to, and see what you're shooting. Yeah. It's, it's kind of important to see what you're shooting, isn't it? To frame up things, I would yeah. say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, Otherwise, you, it, I have done some, I've, I have, you know, I've framed up shots, um, similar sort of thing, where it's like, it, guess, it is guesswork. Like, I'm hoping this is okay. I'm going to shoot it a little bit wider, just in case it's not. Yes. And that's kind of what you ended up doing. Always use a 12 millimeter. Yeah, to be <laughs> sure. I'm a 10 millimeter. You're sure yeah. to be in the frame. Yeah, yeah. 10 millimeters and you get everything in yes. it. It's fine. Yeah. That's great. Uh, what are the aspects of the, the new body you liked? Um, I think you mentioned kind of like the new kind of like digital stabilization, and you're obviously like quite an expert of like digital stabilization mm. yourself, uh, Philip. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, how, how did it help you, like these active modes? So there is um, a new, yeah, new mode, the active mode. Uh, and usually you only have the standard mode, and the active mode allow you to, to have a, a, a also a, an, an electronic stabilization. Mm -hmm. So you have a 10 percent crop, but it's not, it's not a big deal so, because sometimes you just need to, to trust your body even more mm -hmm. uh, in, in specific situation. And I was shooting um, a mountain biker, uh, yes, a mountain biker, uh, when I was uh, in the air. Paragliding, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when I was paragliding. And, and this top shot, I just take the camera in my hands and just make the move by hands and mm. uh, just to, to, to be precise in my move. And I active this new active mode and uh, to, to just to be sure that everything will be very, very smooth. Very smooth, yeah. yeah, yeah. That shot. was very important for this shot. And also, you yeah. can use Catalyst. Yeah, so it's not, this is the, what's confusing is because like the, the little ZV-1, mm -hmm. Americans call it ZV-1, that has the optical and the enhanced mode which is electronic. It's not actually electronic on the A7S mm. III. It's all, it, all it's doing is it's cropping it's in. It's yeah. cropping in even, it's cropping in by 10%, so it's a 1.1 times crop. So it has more of the sensor to move around. There's nothing electronic, but it does record the gyroscopic data. So it records all of the movement of the camera. So when you, if you want to be even more stable and you don't mind cropping in a bit, you can bring it into the, the free Catalyst Brow software and it works for everything except high frame rate shots, the catalyst. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, it, that's where the gyroscopic data isn't saved, which is um, the 100, 120p and 200, 240p. Everything else keeps, it records gyroscopic data. So in post, we, we often we use things like warp stabilize and that sort of thing mm. to try and get rid of some, you know, slightly unnatural movement perhaps, or we want to make it locked off. Um, with Catalyst Brow, and that, that would analyze the image. Catalyst Browse doesn't analyze the image. It takes the data yeah. of the movement, yeah. which results in way, way better results. And you can, you know, you can, you can make it more stable by cropping in more. Uh, I've used it with the, the FX9 and the ZV1. It works mm. with the RX0. It's gyro and it's, it's gyroscopic data is what all these, uh, these little action cameras with built-in stabilization and the 360 cameras use. They use it and they do it at the same time. But the, the great, there's a slight downside to not doing it in camera mm -hmm. in that you have to have an extra step. But it's so much better to do it it's in post the because then you can decide whether you need it yeah. or not. You're not it's, like, it's like shooting in a Rec 709. You wouldn't want to do that because you want that flexibility of like, oh, I wish I'd held the, that window or I wish I, you can make that choice in post, so how much you want to stabilize it. Because if you have electronic stabilization in camera and it creates a bit of a, a funny warpy thing, that's what you've got. Yeah. So the joy, I mean, it's, you know, it is an extra step, but it doesn't take that long to process. Yeah. And, it, and it, resu it, it creates superior results of stabilization in post yeah. when you need it. It's part of our job to yeah. make post-production too. Yeah, we don't always want everything completely rock solid. But sometimes you say, oh, I wish that was, you know, maybe you just knock your tripod and it was a perfect shot. Mm. Run it through Catalyst Browse, it yeah. will just take it off. Yeah, for me, it was a security for some specific shots. Yeah, yeah. no, just, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the one point where the enhanced mode, 
um, which doesn't work in 100, 120p, sadly. Um, but obviously, if you're a lot slower, it, it definitely makes the eye bits better. Because there's more to play with. That's yeah. the thing. It, it's still, still 4K. It's just with a, a slight crop. And it, it, just may, it just takes the edge. Normal eye bits is fine for certain stuff. And then the enhanced is really good for mimicking tripod shots, for static shots, yeah. for handheld. And it does make you know, walking shots a little bit smoother as well. So I think it, I think it works really well. Um, it's, you know, I, if you really want perfect smooth stuff, then you stick it on a gimbal. Yeah, but this course, is all yeah. about, I mean, the combination of the improved IBIS and the, um, the much faster readout so we don't have the rolling shutter artifacts just makes handheld Shooting much better. Like my I want yeah. handheld to look like handheld. I don't want my handheld to look like a gimbal. I want a tripod. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, I, want it, or gimbal. I want it to to look natural, but I don't want it to be wobbly. I don't want to be too shaky. You want that kind of like middle ground, I get like shaky sometimes. Yeah, I've had too yeah. much coffee. Very so, organic footage and not like too like almost exactly. like like if you have had a shoulder rig. rig yeah, or well, that's the best handheld is going to be you know when you have a, a shoulder rig. Heavier yeah. cameras basically will give you when well, heavier cameras that are balanced on your shoulder will give you a nicer handheld. Handheld. Heavier cameras yeah. in front of it. Because it's small, heavy. Yeah, small cameras. Any camera that's not balanced or in smaller cameras, handheld is, is not as going to be as shaky, good. It's yeah. going to be shaky. Mm. And having an improved IBIS with um, that additional... Active mode, yeah. It, 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 it's essential. It looks quite it's similar than if you yeah. had a heavier camera. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I have heavy cameras and they're, they're important, but... Um, my God, just shooting with this light camera, you, I, I can work fast, really mm. fast. And that can be, you know, when you're shooting documentaries, you need to be fast, you need to be reactive to things. You know, if you're shooting you know, with a big crew and a narrative or something, a commercial, then you've probably got people to move the camera for you. You've probably got mm. people to press record for you. Um, but if you're working on your own or you want to work fast and things are always happening, always yeah. seeing shots. And, yeah. and I was, you know, when I was shooting on, on the paddle boarding thing was very simple, one person to follow. But in Brighton, I'm, th I'm always looking around always like looking for, for a good for the shot. Next shot. Yeah. And so I'm like, OK, I need to get over there. I need to get this shot here. So I'm like, drop the tripod, do, do, get the shot. And it was all very quick. And if I was doing that with a big, heavier camera, um, oh my God, I'd have been in so much pain after. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's I'm, yeah, I just I'm just so happy with how well it performed in these things, again, it just makes the, the end result, what we want is the end result to be as good as we want it to be. As good as possible, And these yeah. things really help us. I think, I think, yeah, it's a very good point. Like the two main things that people were kind of like expecting as video shooters, as, as you both guys are, is like obviously you want like a good screen that makes the operability like much simpler for certain angles. And the IBIS in this new active, active mode that is obviously and the quite is handy. And as well, which yeah. is nice, yeah. I, th I think Ben could also kind of like give um, our audience like kind of like a look around about the camera because I think it's quite important also to visualize um, and for, for the audience like what are the improvements in terms of the body, the new port um, and obviously kind of like the, the, the new EVF and the new MI shoe. Uh, ben, can you just um, tell our audience what's new in this camera? Thanks, pierre -Eric. So you'll have seen, like I say, of course, we do have a very angle screen included now on the Alpha 7S Mark III. And as we mentioned as well, there's a full size HDMI port coming in here as well. So again, just that extra bit of reliability when you're out there shooting. If you look at the ports we have on the side, they'll be very similar to other Sony cameras that you're familiar with. So we do have a 3.5 mil microphone jack in on here. We also have a headphone jack and you've got USB sockets at the bottom. So we have USB-C with 3.2. Uh, USB, and that of course is going to be great for very quick data transfer. You can also, of course, power the camera through that, or you can charge it as well. The uh, micro USB on the bottom is compatible with our multi terminal accessories. So the likes of our remotes, which you can use to trigger stills and video and so on, can also be used in there. Now, in terms of the ceiling on here, it's up to about the same level as our Alpha 7R Mark IV and our Alpha 9 Mark II. There are a couple of small differences. So, actually, if you look here, you have a separate door for the microphone jack and also the headphone jack. So if you know you're using the microphone jack, but you're not using the headphone jack, you don't have to have both of those open and exposed at the same time. In addition to that, looking around the camera, 
those of you who are familiar with the Alpha 7R Mark IV or Alpha 9 Mark II might find a lot of familiar things. If somebody's coming from an Alpha 7S Mark II, there's quite a lot of difference within there. So of course, we do have a larger grip on the camera. It is also using that Z series battery. On top of that as well, we've mentioned to you before a little bit about the viewfinder. So that is 9.44 million dot OLED viewfinder. Again, you can have high resolution options for the viewfinder and also quick refresh rates. It has a massive magnification. Uh, and even for glasses wearers, there's a great option where you can reduce the size of the viewfinder so you can get that bit more of eye relief if you need within there as well. Just bringing you and showing you some of the buttons up on the top of the camera. Again, for those of you familiar with the likes of our Alpha 7R Mark IV or Alpha 9 Mark II, there's a lot of familiar things here. So you have not only locks on the mode dial now, but also on the likes of the EV dial, again, if you're going to be using that, and the similar dial, front and back dials that we get on those cameras as well. You'll notice there's a difference here. We also have the movie record button moved to up on top. So in the past, you would find it here where the C1 button is, but the movie record button, of course, is also up here on top. And if you prefer, you can also customize the shutter button to release uh, for movie as well as still images. On top of that, the grip, like I say, as we mentioned being larger, it is also compatible with the same battery grip we use for the likes of the Alpha 7R Mark IV and the Alpha 9 Mark II, the VGC4 EM. So there's great compatibility, extending your battery life using that same grip with that bigger, uh, with that bigger grip on, on there and double batteries. On top of that as well, um, the card slots we've mentioned a little bit. So those are dual card slots using uh, CF Express Type A and SD cards. Nice little touch which I like as well is the fact that the system of interlocking here is also different from our other models. So on the likes of an Alpha 7 Mark III or an R Mark III, you had a switch to unlock your card slots. We then changed that on the R Mark IV and the Alpha 9 Mark II. We improved the seals against dust and moisture even further, where we had an interlocking system where they slid together. Here, you get the best of both worlds. So you get to switch on here and you've got to slide also the door back to open as well. So it's interlocking and with uh, the switch release on there as well. You do have those dual card slots, and as we mentioned, those are compatible with both SD cards and compact flash type A cards on there as well. On top of the camera, as a final point, I'll just mention that we do have, of course, our multi-interface shoe. Now, you can, of course, add audio options to this with a, the 3.5 millimeter jack, but this is also our new digital audio interface. It can take analog signals as well, so if you use some of our older MI shoe microphones, then those will work on here. But if you're looking at the likes of the ECB1M, which is our uh, latest uh, digital microphone, again, this microphone is very innovative, has amazing options for directivity, but a key thing about the quality of it, as well as having the option for analog on there, it has the op option for digital, delivering high quality sound. And that combines, of course, with our Bionz XR processor to deliver really high quality audio. In terms of digital microphones, which we'll also work with here as well, we do have the XLR K3M. And this can also give access into four potential four channel recording and also up to 24 bit audio recording. And again, it can be used um, analog with some of our other models, but it does have the digital option giving you the highest possible quality of audio. And again, that will be powered directly from the camera. So you don't need to worry about the power source of the microphone. In addition to those things, of course, we do offer uh, the likes of wireless lav mics and so on. So you've got the UTX B40 transmitter. We have the likes of the URX P40 receiver as well. And those are compatible with our SMAD P5. Again, this is the latest unit. Those units can be used, of course, with the 3.5 mil jack. But when you use the SMAD P5 in there, that will link into the MI shoe on top of the camera, can send the audio in there and can also transfer digitally. Again, it does have options for analog on there as well, if those are what you need using a different Sony camera. And even on top of that, you've got the UTX P40 as well for connecting our XLR microphones wirelessly as well. So there's great audio options added along to these for your great image as well. Hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of some of the different features we have physically on the camera, some of the different connections with that. Um, and now I'm just gonna pass back to pierre -Eke. Well, thank you, Ben. Um, thank you for uh, presenting the, the overall of the camera. I think it's, um, it's quite good to see, like when I was saying everything is new, I was actually not lying. I'm pretty sure you, you would agree with that. 
the whole hardware has been kind of like redesigned based on, on our customers' feedback, but also thinking of like the operability in the fields, making it like, you know, like the most intuitive possible. Um, thinking about intuitivity, obviously software is a big part of like um, any camera operations and having like a good software. Um, I think this has been asked like for years now. Um, the obvious thing about this camera is it's had like a complete redesign of the menu system, uh, making very accessible, uh, but also completely touch capable. Um, what's your experience, Philip, of, of using this new menu and, and kind of like what, what is your favorite thing about it? That um, I know where things are because, that, let's be completely frank, the, the old menu system isn't intuitive and varies between cameras and things were spread out quite a lot. So, for example, face tracking modes and switching mm. between animals or an eye would be in like a still section and then you'd have to go into the next section of menus into one page to change something else for autofocus and then the next page for that. That is very fiddly and yeah. time consuming. So this is, everything is bunched together where it should be. So, um, you know, like formatting the card is under a media section yeah. where it should be. It's intuitive. I don't read instruction manuals because I'm a guy <laughs> and I don't need to. I mean, it's just, it's obvious where mm. things are. And I think that is really important. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to just have a menu system that doesn't make you, you know, doesn't you just spend, I just spent so much time just searching for stuff. Yeah. The other important thing, which is the My Menu, right at the very top, you can put in all of the most important things that you need. Mm. So whilst we can have stuff on the function menu for quick access and yeah. buttons, there's other things which you don't need constantly. But you press menu and you're right there and you have, you know, a dozen things or whatever it is you need, which are your most common things. So you yeah. never need to go into the other stuff. So that's important. I yeah, I think it'd be great because like that's a very good point. You still have my menu is at the top. So yeah. like Sony Alpha users like will be f feeling right at home if they're using Alpha 7 Mark III, Alpha yeah. 7 R Mark III, Alpha 7 R Mark IV. I think we can actually show the, the live feed of the camera. It would be great to see like in, in, in Ben's uh, kind of like the camera feed so we can kind of like illustrate what we are talking about to the audience because I think not everybody has seen what the menu looks like um, and, and, and Philip's point, I think, is it's very, very true. Like, you want the camera to be operated as fast as possible. And it's also um, useful when you have a second operator. You can just... Yeah. Just and you can save... Change. You can save your settings, settings as well yeah. on a card. So, you know, if, if somebody like, you know, Ben has reset the settings on a camera that he's mm. got, and I've still got my card, I can put my card back in there and yeah. load up my yeah. settings. Because, you know, whenever I've been to any press launch or Sony event and I've been given the camera to test out, I spend the first 20 minutes setting it all up to as I need it to be. Mm. And, and that's yeah. a pain because there's you know, certain things you always do. It's setting up your picture profiles the right way and different order and different things. The so, FN menu also. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I shot the, the movie with two different, two camera, two A7S3. So oh, I, we, see, we see the yeah, menu now so I, you can... I, and so before the shot, uh, I just take time to configure them in the same way, exactly the same way. And so I discover the menu at this moment and, and how easy it is to customize your custom buttons and uh, everything inside. Uh, it was, as you said, very, mm. very uh, time saving. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, I, I really like, love this, this new menu. I think uh, what, what Ben is showing as well, like you probably are like seeing like something quite different with the Sony Alpha cameras and you both quite agree, like it's like it was kind of like overdue in our cameras. Mm. When you're on in obviously in movie modes, like and if you're going into the menu, you see like your movie settings. It's like very obvious you go probably if Ben can go up into kind of like the image quality, and then you see directly your file format movie setting, SNQ settings and etc. It's far more like uh, intuitive for especially for, for, for video shooters, because it used to be very intuitive obviously for steel shooters, but now yeah. we've got a redesign that is fitting also that kind of like video shooting kind of like scenario. So but, and, and you can be afraid because you have more sub menu, but mm. you have also more more possibilities with the camera. So it's it's normal to yeah. have yeah. more numbers of menu. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I mean, what we're seeing in there, what I'm, I'm assuming we'll see in in future models, because one of the most key things is the, is being able to select what comes across 
um, you know, with your shutter speed and your ISO and your picture profiles when you switch between stills and video, mm. which has always been a pain in that, you know, you shoot an S-Log3 mode, you go into stills and all your JPEGs are S-Log3 or S-Log2, whatever it is. Yeah. Now you can set a picture profile for your stills and yeah. then you can have your movie settings. And that is what is ideal. Uh, yeah, and I think that is. Just... I think I think that's what Ben is showing right now. Is like yeah, you can okay. actually tell the camera when I'm in movie mode, I want these settings to happen, and I want to retain them if I jump back to still. So, in a yeah. scenario, you probably agree. Like if you're freelancers, you're going like to shoot. Like for example, my my region is Bordeaux. You have a lot of vineyards, and usually you ask like to do an interview. But he's sometimes putting, he's putting everything. What's the point? Yeah, don't select everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but in this particular instance, like maybe your client is asking for some stills, like to illustrate or to put on their website, and yeah. suddenly you're jumping like to steal photography, and you might find yourself like jumping back like to your movie settings, and suddenly everything is light, and you have to reset everything. Yeah. The good thing about this camera, if you're an average shooter, is like it kind of like it keeps in memory your your settings, and you. You can change around and shoot video um, um, stills and then go back and forth without kind of like losing the ability to have your right settings instantly. Because yeah. prior to that, I would put on um, onto one of the C modes, because I actually have three now, I think. Mm -hmm. But pre previously, I would put on my still settings onto one of my custom modes, yep. which yeah. is OK, except that will be based upon something that you saved in a particular situation where it brings everything across. Whereas you know, all I really want is basically my picture profile to not be brought across. Um, and most other things I actually do want to just stay the same because I've got my exposure right and everything like that. It's, you know, sometimes you maybe, you want your shutter speed perhaps to be higher generally in, mm. in stills. It's, it's that sort of, it's having that, the choice is the key thing. That's yeah. Because we, the way you shoot stills is different to the way you shoot video. Yeah, yeah exactly. And personalization, as you yeah. said, like picture profile for you is really important because you're like the, yeah. the look you want to give into your images. I mean, obviously raw, doesn't, you're shooting raw anyway. Yeah, but so. I, I'm, you know, I do, a, I spend a lot. You know, I'm always sending photos over yeah. to my phone and that will send the JPEG yeah. with the baked in um, profile. Which, if you've been shooting log, you try grading log on your phone. A photo. Yeah. 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 No, 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 it's not. It's not a much fun. Absolutely. Um, I think one last thing, and I just wanted, like, maybe to quickly mention. Obviously, this camera is very much oriented for um, video shooters, yeah. um, and you're both filmmakers. Um, but obviously, this camera has like a few tweaks that I believe like will be very appreciated from our still photography audience. Um, for example, in the kind of like creative profiles, we used to have only like three characteristics we could change around, which was saturation, contrasts, mm -hmm. um, um, and, and sharpness. Now we've got up to eight, so you can really personalize those profiles and really give a look to your JPEGs straight off the camera. So like, like in your instance, like when you want like to quickly send like a JPEG to someone that needs yeah. it like quite instantly, you can give like a really personalized look and not really relying on the basic profile of the cameras, which basically everyone's using, like the standards, Vivids, and et cetera. So yeah. it's quite also good they, they included that on top of four new profiles, I think. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm not going to touch clarity, but all the other ones are. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, but yeah, this is some portraits with maximum we clarity. clarity. Yeah. yeah. For me, I, I would do all my selfies like you. Um, with clarity at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm just keeping it so beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a little bit too much details probably like yeah. Yeah, I, I, in, a, in, a, in a headshot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we covered like most of the things and, um, and, and without further ado, I think we should be jumping to the Q&A because a, a lot of people have been asking in the chat comments. Um, 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 in the Q &A, so I'm just gonna... Um, so our producing team will, will send us like some of the questions and we'll try to either me or obviously our guests um, is the most important. So the first question is probably, yeah, it's probably a question for me. Um, um, will the new systems become available to previous models uh, by firmware updates? Um, so obviously this is a question like everyone is asking since yesterday, like this new menu system everyone is like really happy about. Some people prefer the old menu system, I think. Um, it was just like well, a... Who? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, some people so using alpha like, like for yeah. six, seven, oh, eight yeah. years. They are probably like very keen also it's and very used to, to use that in their workflow. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously we can recommend re on new product announcements and new firmware updates, so I cannot really officially comment on behalf of Sony on this. Um, but we'll definitely pass on uh, pass on those numerous comments uh, to an engineering team for, for for their consideration in future developments. Maybe you could put in an, uh, an old-fashioned mode 
Yeah. <laughs> switch between. If you like the old menus, go in old menus. Uh, which I would like to precise is not possible at the moment. Maybe, <laughs> I don't want to confuse maybe everyone you can also on the screen. A, a bad rolling shutter effect mode as well, just, just for that whole sort of like retro vibe. Yeah. We call him Philip Huck. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over to the next question, with his, uh, which is, do you consider the Alpha 7S uh, Mark III as a cinema camera? Um, well, um, I think uh, we can have like our filmmakers answer, but obviously our cinema line um, is very specific um, at Sony. Uh, obviously, this camera is very capable of like uh, being a really good C or, or, yeah. or B camera in a cinema production set. Obviously, there are a lot more than just resolution frame rates to consider when you're shooting um, on the cinema set. You have like obviously the workflow. Um, yeah. um, you have specific, uh, specifically dedicated cameras like the Sony Venice that have a design and an operability that is designed for that purpose as well. Um, there are also workhorse like to do, uh, that can do continuous shooting for hours and hours. So um, although these cameras are very good, and uh, maybe uh, it, you want it, to jump it, on yeah, this I question. Mean, it, it, it's, it's a video camera, first yeah. and foremost. And the difference between a video camera and a cinema camera is like... They, it's not only SDI it's not, it's, there's, there's different <laughs> things which can... But I think the key thing is, because there's no DCI 4K, mm. um, there isn't that, and there isn't a dead-on 24p mode. Yeah. Those are the two, which, is the, which you get with Cine Alta, those are probably the two things which would classify it as a cinema camera if it had it. Mm. But for everybody, 99% of us, 99.9% .9 of us who are shooting, it will do everything you want it to do. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, quite frequently a cinema camera is a camera that doesn't have most of the features of other cameras. It doesn't have autofocus. It doesn't have, you know, yeah. and it, it, it's an. This is an incredibly powerful video camera. Yeah, and that is what we must not forget: just how good it is. Can you use it to shoot high-end cinema productions? Of course, you could shoot, use anything. The camera will be used for cinema for sure. Yeah, I of guess. course it will. It's 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 you know it's more than. Yeah. Good yeah. yeah, and we, we need to also understand that, you know, each tool has its purpose. We shouldn't think about cameras that, oh yeah, this camera can do everything, so it must be the perfect camera or the number one camera. I think each camera has a, has a kind of like a, a design, a by design, a purpose to, um, to fulfill like kind of like a gap or like a creative kind of like craving, which is in this case like freelancers being like very flexible and need, needing like that super high quality in video and needing like something very operable, intuitive, lightweight, and etc. And this is kind of like the answer. And, and Sony as a system also is got kind of like offering like cameras that are maybe more fit, like as an A camera for this kind of production, like an FX9. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why they also designed it like to fit within that realm where you can like, for example, in s -Log space, you know, like the colors and the tone are matching the FX9. So, yeah, you I know, it's like I you did, should think about cinema yeah. production as a kind of like a system yeah. rather than just one camera. I use I use the A7S III on a uh, a B camera on, on a shoot about six weeks ago, mm -hmm. and you know FX9 was the main camera both in S Log three uh, S match. S yeah. Gamma three Cine. That's such a weird name. <laughs> and they S it, Gamma three. And I don't know if you've heard of this guy called Alistair Chapman. He's yes. quite he's quite a nice guy, and he does these LUTs which you should buy on his site because they're brilliant. And I the paddleboard one, my video was using mm -hmm. one of his Venice look LUTs. Chucked it on there. And both brilliant. Off. brilliant. Yeah. And that's what I use in the FX9 as well. His, his LUTs are fantastic. Mm. And the color science has been improved. You know, if I was trying to match these cameras before, it would have been quite difficult, even with S Log 3. Because, you know, whilst they're called S Log 3 and you've got the same wire balance, it, they, there's always something off. But it was so accurate and so good. So, yeah, I mean, if you want that Venice look, Mm. Which is a beautiful look. You shoot an S Log three, S Gamma three Cine, and then you use one of Alistair's LUTs, and you can get a great starting point. Mm -hmm. It's a great. Either you don't just chuck on a LUT and leave it. A LUT is a starting point, and you work from that. But I was amazed at amazed at how good it just looked. Just dumping that on there. Mm. It's done a good job. Um, another another question was. Um, at Sony Europe, is it possible to record any 4K RAW internally? So sadly, I can answer that question, no. Uh, RAW recording is only external. Uh, we obviously output a signal of 16 bits, um, but then it really depends on the kind of like codecs used uh, by external recorder manufacturer. Um, we are, obviously, it's not a secret. We are working together with Atomos to deliver um, from the launch in September 
Um, um, obviously, uh, compatibility with the latest external recorder, like the Ninja, Ninja, um, Ninja 5. Um, so, um, unfortunately, not internally, but very, very easy to shoot an yeah. external row um, yeah. um, um, with this camera I in 4K. I shot the paddleboard video with that, and uh, I was able to record internally at the same time to two cards. And it's great. I mean, it's, it's the benefit of shooting raw. It just gives you more flexibility. Um, the ProRes raw of the of you know you can change your ISO, mm. you can change your white balance, and you you there's no noise reduction, so you have total control of security of your image. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it, I I think it's good. But the internal codec is you know people do obsess over raw too much. The internal codec, especially the iframe co the iframe codec, is actually a joy to edit with, and that's always been the problem. Is Internal codecs can can often be very difficult with B frame long ops. It's like, mm. especially H two six five is a nightmare, and we see a lot of I frame cameras with I frame codecs which are H two six five based, and yeah. you have to transcode them. You can't edit with them, but because the X A B C S I, I, I so I, many names, all intra, yeah, yeah, the all, all intra, intra version is an H two six four based codec. You can edit it. Straight away, straight it's very away. much yeah, like the I shot a wall movie in, in this uh, new code. All in try, yeah. yeah. I mean, all in try, yeah. I've forgotten. I mean, with the FX9, I edit native, but with generally with all my other cameras with the mm. H.264s and H.265s, I just go into ProRes, and it's so much nicer not yeah. to have to do that. And I edit it with a laptop, so and, and it works very well. Yeah. I, I, th I think it was the main design purpose as well. Like also, like we wouldn't like limit. You don't want to limit like certain codecs like to a certain crowd. You want to give the accessibility and the, tr the creative choice. Like mm -hmm. like you say, H.265 is a little bit more risky because like it drives a little bit more power in your editing room. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to manage that and also like the size of your storage. Um, while you have like all intra, that is kind of like the, the more kind of like um, the more like how we I would say hungry hungry yeah. uh, kind of like yeah. codec which but gives it, more base it space. Well. It, it's well. so it's roundabouts because the H two six five will be more efficient for your cards yeah. and take up less space because the numbers you know we're at hundred megabits per second on one and it would be the same for H two six five. But the H265 is twice as efficient. It is twice Once as efficient. Once it saves space on your cards, yes. you then have to transcode it, and then you're losing space on your yeah. hard yeah. drives. So it's, for me, it's, 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 it's for the H265 10 bits, which a lot of cameras do, uh, the stills cameras, mm. um, was necessary because that's all they could do. To now have an iframe codec in 10 bit internally is, yeah. is brilliant to me. I think that's the main thing is like to, to to have that choice of like customizing your codec depending on your needs and 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 giving you possibilities there if you want to. Yeah, it's still there if you want to. You still yeah, yeah for some workflows like it's absolutely fine. Especially like if you've got, you internal know, profile yeah. like good lighting condition. Yeah. You know, you'll you'll be absolutely fine and smaller si file size so you can edit very quickly and. Yeah, I think yeah, it's an important point. Yeah. Yeah, XAVCS is still there, so we're not kicking out XAVCS and giving you like the very yeah. demanding codex. We're still giving you like the option to ten bits in XAVCS, which is like a very kind of like known codec in the in the, in the videography world now. And then you can still dump it down, I would say, um, yeah. to eight bits if you really don't require like the flexibility. Yeah, but ten bit was very very efficient during my post production process. Okay. It's, it's not that much more. It's, I think it's 120 megabits per second or 140. It's not that much more than the eight bit, which was 100. Yeah. So not it's not that big a deal, and you don't have to have crazy fast cards to record at that. So that's that's important. There is that I have I tried to work out all the different bit rates for all the different modes, and there turns out to be like. Two to three hundred different variations, depending on all the S and Q modes and mm. stuff, and very few of them require the new um, CF, CF Express you have type A cards. Yeah, um, most of them will work absolutely fine with the B sixties. Um, some of the the i the iframe will need a V ninety cards, and yes. they're not so bad. Uh, but I, the, I think the huge benefit. The, I'm so happy when I. I heard there's going to be new media cards in there. I was like, oh, well, no. Fred, yeah. yeah, they're no. going to they're going to limit I, like yeah. uh, the, how much the features. Money am I going to have to spend on this. Yeah, but the fact is, you there's two slots yeah. which take SD card slots, and there's the same slots will take these little cards. So that's very smart. It's so smart. Yeah. So you can slowly transition to the fast cards. You only the need these cards, for yeah. a couple of the modes for the. Yeah. The highest frame rate, high four K, one hundred twenty p, all intra for yeah. for those who's wondering. I yeah. do recommend them, but yes, you can stick with your yeah. your SD card and don't buy. They're very cute. quickly. 
these new oh, ones. They're very cute. They look like um, uh, like a, a Nintendo <laughs> DS thingy or something like that. Well, and I, you can I, jump on it because it's. Uh, I'm not jumping on it. <laughs> I, I think it's that's tough. very important what you were mentioning, like having like the story media, like that options, especially because obviously this camera is not cheap. Like we're not gonna like. To totally say like, oh, this camera is a cheap camera and is accessible with everyone. It's, it has a specific purpose of like shooting high-end video for either enthusiasts or professionals. It's yeah, it's um, but it, it, I think it was very essential thinking about like the independent filmmakers. Like these guys don't have like the deepest pocket in the world. So if yeah. they invest in the body, they want to be straight away being able like to use most of the features or ninety-nine percent of the features and having the possibility to have like all the recording formats or like almost all of them except for three or four in, in a yeah. V60 format for the cards. Yeah. That makes it quite accessible also for, for these filmmakers, but it doesn't mean like they are going to need like to spend hundreds and hundreds in replacing their cards, can make a which is very important. Yeah. The XMVCS yeah. 10-bit, um, it's very is, good. it looks great. Yeah. It looks great and you don't have to buy new loads of new cards for it. So as soon as you have 10-bit, you, 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 that's the big jump. You're happy. Yeah. <laughs> you're happy. And a great 4K in low light with 12 megapixel. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got another. Uh, well, we've got another question. That apparently, has been uh, asked quite a few times. But um, unfortunately, uh, we cannot add uh, LUTs uh, inside the camera. Uh, we can only shoot uh, in the profiles, and the LUTs are applied only in post production. Um, another question, which is about the why there is um, an ISO quality uh, sure. jump at 16K. I'm sorry, I cannot read. Uh, Yes. Properly in so small. From 12,800 when you yeah. move up to 16K. Um, so what, what I can, uh, what I can uh, talk about is obviously um, uh, there's a new processor and there's a new, uh, a new, bind, um, a new sorry, um, sensor, 12 megapixel back illuminated. So uh, like Ben explained earlier, it's, uh, the processing part is much better. Um, um, in to quantify like, the low light capabilities of this camera, obviously the Alpha 7S Mark II was already mm -hmm. great. Uh, what we quantified, and of course, like you can do the testings and etc., you yeah. gain about one stop of of of, um, of uh, advantage in terms of high ISO. So that's why you're going to probably see in the mid to high ISO an improvement from your Alpha 7s Mark II if you're a current owner, or for people that have seen footage from the Alpha 7s Mark II. Yeah, I mean, is that is that something you experienced both uh, both of you? I did. I did a lot of testing on you this. Did yeah, more, cause more than me. Yeah. Speaking to Gerald Undone, he was the one who said to me, "Why is it? Why is there such a better quality, less noise at 12,000, 16,000?" I went, "Is it? I haven't noticed." And so I, I said it could be noise reduction, no. uh, but it isn't, it isn't that. He, he's convinced it's a dual, it's a dual um, ISO, but I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's for, I did some tests. It's not noise reduction because I shoot, shot raw, and it's clearly not, but it's a big jump. Um, Alistair Chapman said it could be an analog to digital converter, mm -hmm. which kicks in a certain thing, which does give, because there is a stop less dynamic range at 16,000. Mm -hmm. It goes from 30, yeah, it, it just, it drops when it yeah. gets cleaner. So that could be what it is. Most likely, and they're not going to, you're not going to, we haven't heard exactly, but it's definitely not a dual um, ISO sensor. Right. I noticed the same thing on the, the A7 III at 4000 ISO, you have mm -hmm. to jump. You better be to, uh, at 4000 than just, yeah. just be Know low. where these points are, so, because your image is going to, you know, literally be cleaner if you go up just ISO up, that's, to a certain yeah. point, and that you know, can go, and we're talking like that's why a, it's very, big, a big step. It's, yeah. That's why it's yeah. very important to always try your your, your setup before and yeah. make experiments. Um, well, that's very good. Um, I can confirm, like maybe officially, because uh, some discussion about dual ISO. So obviously, we don't have dual ISO in this sensor. We have a brand new XMO R back illuminated sensor, um, twelve point one megapixel, as you already know. So it's not um, dual ISO uh, sensor. Um, I'm gonna actually jump on like maybe a question for Ben. Um, is touch focus available on imaging edge mobile um, uh, as a camera control? So um, is touch focus available on imaging edge? So unfortunately, um, touch focus isn't going to be possible at the moment on imaging edge mobile. Um, thank you very much for your feedback. I think Pierre mentioned uh, once already. We do like to give out your feedback to Tokyo. They've been very busy with this camera. We like to make them busier. Um, but unfortunately, there won't be touch focus with Imaging Edge Mobile. There are other, are other connection improvements, which maybe we've not had a chance to touch on today. So um, connecting via HDMI onto a monitor um, with the likes of an S Mark II. If you're shooting that in 4K, you lose maybe your image 
on the screen on the back of the camera. Some of our more recent models like the Alpha 7R Mark IV or the Alpha 6600, you'd be able to shoot 4K having an external monitor and also see the screen on the back, but that was shooting with those cameras with um, shooting in 4K 24p and with proxy turned off. With this camera though, you can be connected over HDMI. You can also have a, a Wi-Fi connection onto Imaging Edge Mobile um, and still have the image on the screen um, pretty much in all recording modes with proxy turned on or off. And again, that's something which is thanks to that brand new Bionz XR processor inside the camera as well. Thank you, Ben, uh, for this explanation. I uh, hope it clarified uh, for, for the person asking this question um, what they were looking for. Uh, we've got quite a funny, obviously, question. Uh, we're going to pick them up as well. Um, so in terms of like uh, IAF, uh, Philip, I think this question is for you. Uh, did the IAF work for you, Cat? Cat, I've got more than one. Yeah. Uh, I've got five. Um, yeah, it works. It works great in stills. Um, there is no video support, and I am constantly writing to the CEO of Sony to implement it. And I'm starting a change.org petition to get it in there as well. At the moment, the only way I can get it to work, and it does work, is using touch tracking. I yeah. just press mm. screen where their eye is, and it, it's it's not ideal, but it does work, um, and it's great. Uh, back, um, it was back in 2017, I went to Tokyo, and I went we went to um, Sony HQ, and we had a big meeting, and they're asking us what features do you want, and I said I want <laughs> eye autofocus to work on cats, dogs, and they went. Is that important? I went, yes. And then about a year or so later, they announced it. I was like, yes. <laughs> now we just need it to work on not just cats and dogs, but everything. So you have to make a short movie about your cats. I, well, uh, 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 I have done many. Okay, and I will sorry. continue to do many. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's great. Especially Lollipop. I think Lollipop is a lot in your videos. Um, I'm a She's the youngest. Yeah, yeah she's, she's, she's two tomorrow, and um, so she's the most lively, and she is in that case, yeah. So, I mean, it's... She's... Yeah, she moves... The other... That's the thing is, my old cats, they're very easy to get in focus because they don't do much. They sleep. Uh, but her, they... And her and... They move too much. Her and Jimmy, they just run around the whole time. He's hard, though, because he's a black cat, so he's much harder to keep in focus because of the contrast. But, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and I'm looking forward to when you guys implement it into video. Is that going to be soon? Uh, well, well, obviously considering uh, all the comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked for it for the FX. Camera, I'm sure. Like, I want it on the FX9 got, as well. Uh, I got the message uh, <laughs> from you, Philip. I think the latest questions was, um, will obviously um, the Atomos ProRes uh, format be available uh, at launch um, and with the Alpha 7S Mark III in September? Obviously, we cannot confirm fully, 100%, uh, the availability of this uh, new codec in the external recorder. Uh, what we know is we've been working closely with Atomos in developing um, um, this compatibility as soon as possible and as soon as the camera is in the market. I think uh, Philip already had like some um, testing mm -hmm. uh, for Atomos themselves um, and, and kind of like gave his feedback and etc. So it's definitely. Yeah. under development it's, and should be available fairly soon. Yeah, it's great. I mean, the only thing you need to understand is you won't be able to record uh, the 100 and 120p in Pro Resort because it's a limitation of HDMI. Yeah, HDMI mm. 2.1. So it's up to yeah. 60p, 60p yeah. uh, and it, and it, it's great. You know, it's, the option is there and it's, you know, it's, it's a nice format of RAW to work with. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, as I, said, as I said earlier, it's nice to be able to record and my experience previously with ProRes RAW has been the camera won't let you record internally at the same time. And I love the fact that this camera lets me have... Both. Yeah, I have not just um, one backup, I have two. Because I, oh, I always record to dual slots. Because it's only happened once, but I had a card get... I was shooting one card, being, you know, thinking, oh, I don't need two. It's two. And it got corrupted, and I lost everything. And from that moment on, everything I shoot is dual card. I don't copy them all, but it's just that safety of knowing yeah. it's there, and to know that I've got pro as well. And you know, it's, it's, it's. I think I think people need to get into the habit of doing that. Mm -hmm. It's most likely going to be um, not going to ever happen any issues. 
but it's that one moment, that one time when that card fails, will, yeah. you know, it could be on the most important job you've ever done. And just because you couldn't be bothered putting another card in the slot. So you're happy to have a backup. Yeah. You have a yeah. backup, yeah. I mostly use internal recording, so... Are you going to yeah. buy it? No, you're going to buy the A7S III. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> How many? How many? Yeah. Two. <laughs> Two? No. Only one, only one. It's enough. Uh, I'll be, I obviously want one, yeah. So... Um, a question for you, Philip, again. Yeah, I think we've got a question for um, uh, Philip here. Um, um, it's about row recording again. Yeah. Uh, did you do a demo with the 16-bit row? Uh, no. <laughs> 240 FPS 16-bit row 2. No, you can't do it. Uh, yeah. No, I know of. No, it's, it's not possible. Um, you can do... Your bit, it outputs 16-bit raw, mm -hmm. but it's not recording. Yeah. It's recording 12-bit various raw, and it doesn't... I don't think it doesn't do 240 frames per second, so yeah. it doesn't do it. Uh, so that's internal only. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, maybe one day we'll have that. But again, I don't really feel that it's, it's essential. So the internal codec, it's one of the most data intensive codecs is 240 frames per second in HD because it's recording so many frames and that does need the little cards. So it's a lot of data to pump out of an HDMI. Even the, even the full-size one. Even the full-size one, yeah. And, yeah, obviously, like, we have the HDMI 2.1, which is, like, the standard at mm -hmm. the moment. So until, like, we go to in, a new standard of HDMI, yeah, I'm sure we're going to unlock those kind of, like, features as well and, yeah. and, and kind of, like, let people, like, record externally. But we don't home. really want 16-bit raw. We, we want 20-bit raw now. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's not enough. It's not enough. No. Can't grade pro also, I can't like, grade with 16-bit. It's not enough. But it's like, uh, I guess it's like uh, done sampling. Like, you know, you get more yeah, data that's you, true. you're compressed. So that's you true. have like a far better image in 12-bit than uh, just... And if you upload, I mean, it, is upload amazing, it on YouTube. You know, I've worked with 16-bit stills, 16-bit raw stills, and that is absolutely amazing. And, and if we could record video in that format without it being crazy data intensive, of course I would. Mm. This, but the difference is between stills and video. It's a few frames, not hours and terabytes of footage. And after YouTube just destroy Yeah, I mean, oh my God, you spent all this time making something look as good as possible and then YouTube compresses it at like <laughs> three megabits per second, eight bit. And you're like, great, yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that's the unfortunate thing at the moment. It's like, obviously, for grading 10 bit is great, but yeah. like, unfortunately, maybe most of you know, but um, YouTube compressing in 8-bit, like, doesn't a give crazy, you, like, full sad ability. 8-bit, We've yeah. been struggling yeah. uploading your content, like, from, from this camera to give it the best look possible because I, that 8-bit compression. I made about 60 different versions of the Brighton video and grades and exports. If you look, at, it's still on my account of YouTube to, mm. to, to get the least banding yeah. as possible. In the end, I had to brighten up the, day, the nighttime stuff because it hates dark stuff. But if you go to Vimeo, mm -hmm. which is 10-bit, my original grade is on there. It's so much yeah. nicer. And you can download it as well. I will subscribe yeah. to upload on Vimeo. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I, think, I think we've got another question about Philip. Uh, like a very quick one. Yeah. Um, obviously a bit cheeky. Yep. Uh, we've seen Olivier's um, kind of like full review uh, um, French, on live you now. But wh when is no, your I review? Can't watch. I can't watch. So my review is, um, is long. And it's okay. epic. And it, uh, if you hadn't have me here, I probably would have finished it by now. But I am going to oh. definitely have it done when it's finished. <laughs> so uh, that's soon, a good answer. Soon. A safe it, answer. It is epic. It covers, it's basically, I did, an F, I did a two hour FX line review, which was very obviously. Mm. It was a lot. It won't be as long as that. But I, I've covered a lot and I had BTS on both of the shoots. Mm. And I also show how to use noise reduction. I show lots and lots and lots of things. And I think you'll find it very entertaining. It's, yeah. it's fun, it's educational, and uh, I hope it, I need it to be done soon because I yeah. have been working yeah, you've ridiculous been hours to get it done. Working quite hard and, and, yeah. and because of us. So I, I we deeply apologize I, I for people waiting good. for that review. Like we've been yeah. keeping Philip busy. I wanted um, it to be in, live in at 3 months. p.m. yesterday and I tried so hard to make it. And I was just like, my problem is when I'm, doing a review and there's a feature, I can't just say it does this. I need to show it and explain mm. it. And that takes time. Takes yeah. time, yeah. Yeah. And I, otherwise, it's not a job done properly. Yeah. 
I think I think we've got uh, another question uh, to for Olivier this time. Um, obviously, in your in your short movie, you have like uh, some um, some like I would say like some shot from the sky from the cyclists. And some people are wondering how did you manage to to put it on a drone? Because I guess like with these kind of weights, you need kind of like a very expensive drone to to wear that. How how did you manage like to do these so, shots? Yeah, the, the idea was to to try to use the camera in very uh, in a lot of situations. And to show capabilities and and efficient and relevant situations, and so uh, I had the idea to to put the camera in the sky. I didn't know how to do it. So first of all, I, I was thinking about a drone shot uh, to put the camera under a stabilizer a gimbal mm. on the drone. Uh, but I didn't find any company who agree to to work without an inspire. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to to, to try. Uh, to, 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 look, to look for um, an helicopter mm -hmm. and it was too expensive yeah <laughs> so I, guess, I decided uh, to just to just um, to just go with the paraglider so this shot was uh, yeah. was taken <laughs> this way with a paraglider which is quite amazing because like the risk it took like to show you some some amazing Shots, you obviously. risked your life for us. <laughs> yeah, you risked you 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 risk his life to, <laughs> I didn't to, risk anything. to push this camera to the tests. Like, and obviously, like, my I'm stomach, sure like, most of my them all appreciate that. Uh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Because we had to, to make several, um, uh, several, uh, several, I would say in English, mm. pass, you know, to, to have the right. Uh, you, know, uh, several, you had like to several go passes. several times, like several, to, times, several yes. times to get the right shot. Yeah. So you didn't just do it once, you did no, it like no, several maybe 10 times. times yeah. Yeah. I had a funny comment in, on, one of the, on the YouTube, on the, on the paddleboard video, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm track, uh, Julian is going along in the water in the paddleboard, and it's a lovely tracking shot. And mm. somebody asked me what slider I used. And I went, yeah, no, I didn't use a slider. I was in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> you can't use a slider can't on a boat. Can't really use a slider. That defies the purpose of it's the slider. Should try. It would have to be uh, very long, yeah. and it would have to be able to be on water. You know, like, I yeah. think a, a slider on a gimbal. A slider, a slider on, on a gimbal, gimbal would, in a boat. That's a concept. On yeah, a gym. A concept, yeah. Is on a drone. That's what I'm. At. That's my on a paraglide. On a <laughs> whilst paragliding, that would be a that very expensive shot. That is how you should like, do it. Should be useless, mm -hmm. but. We have to try. You've got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth doing. If it, if it tells, it helps tell the story. You do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, a quick question, like to come back on the gyroscopic data, um, um, and asking, like, um, is IBIS collecting gyroscopic info uh, in and kind of like embedded it into the metadata? Um, do any softwares like work with this kind of like? Um, Software not yet. Software stabilization. Not yet. So not yet. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. I mean, I've Catalyst. I've been told that it's their work. They're looking at getting integrated into the NLEs, and that would be amazing yeah. to be able to use the data. So at the moment, you have to use the, the dedicated software. But hope I've been told that they're working on it. So I hope because it would mm. be so Maybe much easier. Maybe in Premiere someday. It will be in Premiere at some point. I'm sure. Um, it, there's no reason why not. It should be amazing. It'll so, be, yeah, it would be a joy to have it. Just yeah. as a yeah. sip, instead of use, when using warp stabilizer, it doesn't analyze the image, it takes the data. It would be great. And as you said, like, it's a creative choice after. So it's quite good to have this kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, feature. Oh, this question is interesting. Yeah. Can we expect 480 FPS in 700? Uh, in 700 so in HD, basically. <laughs> in basic um, 720p. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very difficult uh, thing to answer right now because obviously we're not talking about any future um, um, feature development, anything like that. So none of our cameras are capable uh, of doing that. So I wouldn't really be able like, to gonna answer have your to, question. You're going to have to lose a lot of quality. Yeah, I would not use yeah. this kind of resolution. You're, you're far better off shooting at, at, at 1080, 240. Yeah. And then at a higher shutter speed, and then doing it in post. If, if you it, really so need yeah, really really need these kind of shots. Yeah, it's I think very it, specific, and, and very specific you lose a lot of resolution. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it's not I think this kind of like you know, like when you have exploding colors and these kind of things. Maybe some applications like that. Um, this may be interesting, but at the moment, water it's balloons not, on face. Is yeah, basically, with a lot yeah. of light. That's what you want. That's the only reason to shoot at that because it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or Mentos in a Diet Coke. Um, yeah. Another question is like kind of probably the, the most kind of like uh, asked questions uh, so far. So why you didn't increase the resolution of the Alpha 7S Mark III 
Uh, 12 megapixel is not enough um, uh, for pro photographers. Um, well, um, obviously, the main reason of this camera is to kind of like the, the, the starting point for our engineers is like to, to, to go from where the Alpha 7S Mark II was so appreciated, which is low lights mm -hmm. and the 4K. That was the two main points where everyone was blown away. Yeah. That's why everyone is still using it at the moment as a, even a B camera is still like in someone's bag, where, a freelancer's bag, because it's so good. So that was the starting point. So if you start to increase the megapixel count on your sensor, obviously it becomes much harder to increase your dynamic range, which was obviously very appreciated in this shooting context. It's much harder to control your rolling shutter. And obviously you're compromising on the most important aspect of the camera, which was the, 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 the starting round of the, yeah, the low light, exactly. So I think you're also, gonna have, you're also gonna have issues with heat. Yeah, that's abs the, that's absolutely. The thing is, yeah, you know, well. we the FX9 is a is a six, you know, is a, like a twenty four megapixel six yeah. K sensor, which gun samples to four K. It's a beast. It's got cooling and everything in it. And the camera, I've done I've done days of overheating tests yeah. to see what what how and it does really really well. It's only you know in crazy high temperatures and really pushing it because it's sampling one to one. It's able to do these high frame rates without generating crazy Very heat. Quickly, it's, it's, yeah. What creates heat is processing. processing and the, the processing pixels, when you yeah. have to bring down the higher megapixels down to lower. That, what's cre that creates heat. And that's, yeah, that's, that's, we, we didn't talk about overheating, and it's, it's very important, an important mm. point, I guess. And I was shooting during hours, maybe five, six hours outside under the sun, and I had no alert, no information, no issue with overheating, mm -hmm. no issue with the battery, and that's a huge point. Yeah. And uh, obviously, I, I wasn't shooting during six, it wasn't six hours of recording time. Mm. It's six hours of uh, Shoot, power time. Framing, you like have, you're recording, you frame it, you, you record around. it, yes, yes. Yeah. move around, you check your, your footage. So it's around six hours of, of using the camera, and, and I had no issues. Uh, and that's very, very... I important. shot 12 hours continuous in one of my tests at 4K 25. No issues at all. Also, I stopped because I got bored. Um, I, <laughs> wasn't, I wasn't watching well, it. Well, that's half a day but of recording. Yeah, I was like, at some point I had to stop. And then I, obviously I've increased it in things. And at one point my temperature got up to, because I had a heat lamp on it, to uh, 48 degrees. It wouldn't, I couldn't, the temperature couldn't read anymore because the thermometer was all... Uh, to the candle that the thermometer was leaning against was melting, uh, wow. and the camera was still recording. And the it it, ha it did overheat a couple of times on on the high frame rates. The most uh, taxing is is the H two six five, the XAB XABC HS. Yeah, because more compression. High, power yeah, so that's needed, the one yeah. that when it did overheat and, and shut down, it didn't. It wasn't long though. It was like the recovery time was like a minute or two, and then you could do you know uh, carry on recording for a bit. But if you shoot it in, in the less taxing modes, it's unless you're in crazy heat, you're yeah. going to be absolutely fine. And I think I think it's the right lead to point that out is that the, the kind of like the design choice behind this camera and the 12 megapixel as well is like yeah. you need something reliable. Like people need to understand. Obviously, if you increase the number of megapixel, you're making like design choices. What do you yeah. What do you kind of like advantage the rolling shutter or the resolution, the sharpness, etc., or the ISO range? Something, something, yeah. something, something that something we, will be, would be compromised yeah, by doing that. So it, the compromise here is it is a lower resolution for stills. Yeah. That's the compromise. But as this is a video centric device, mm -hmm. it was the right decision. To and you can still do good photographs. Good photos, yeah. good as, selfies, as a photographer, good I, I know that's yeah. Uh, yeah, I need. More yeah. pixel for photos. You know for what? Sure, high resolution shows all your flaws anyway. Yeah. Uh, not that yeah. you have any, but I do. But yeah, I mean, I, I've shot a lot. I, I do a lot of stills, and I shot a lot of stills. And actually, I was amazed at the detail that I was getting out of this. Definitely way better than the A7S2 stills. Um, because actually, when, when I was shooting um, uh, on the BTS, I have stills from the A7S2 and stills from the A7S3. Mm. It's still nice to say that. A7S3 is finally there. And the difference is way, is way better. So yeah. it's actually, uh, it, yeah, would I like higher? Sure. But mm. I am prepared yeah. to, you know, compromise because this is a video camera. This is a video camera that shoots stills as well, mm. as opposed to a stills camera that shoots video. Yeah. And, and obviously, like, I think like you're right, like still do, it's still full frame. 
Um, you still get 10 frames per second for people shooting action. Um, with this new CF Express, you have like virtual, like, like unlimited buffer. I think it's like something ridiculous, like a thousand uh, yeah. uncompressed rows, which is basically a hundred seconds of like continuous shooting, mm -hmm. which is something you'll never, never you know, go to that point. Yeah. No, I would. And for my cats. <laughs> yeah. For your cat to yeah. get the perfect frame. The younger one. The younger one. Of uh, the perfect lollipop expression, yeah. probably. Um, but I think like at, with those IIs and et cetera, if you're a stargazer, all these kind of guys, like if you got your right framing, you don't really need to recrop your image. Yeah. You'll still be like amazed by this camera. And I think a lot of like shooters, especially those kind of like low light shooters will be like, no, 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 I search actually 12, uh, give me 12 megapixel. Sure. It's plenty enough for me. I don't need to do um, huge prints at home and I can, I can yeah. still deliver some amazing pictures. I would, I would personally, if I, you know, if I was shooting as if still to my primary focus, mm -hmm. I would use my A7R4. Yeah. Of course I would, because that's what it's designed for. It's, it's, the detail is astonishing. Yeah. And I love that. And so it's, it's, you know, it's the right tool for the right job. So you know, if, if, you, if your primary focus is stills and you shoot mm -hmm. a little bit of video, this may be not the camera for you. But if your primary focus is video, and you maybe don't need to shoot stills, so what if you just do a little bit of stills, mm -hmm. without question. This is, mm. it's, it was, yeah, I, you know, I, as I said, I would have loved to have had a slightly more, but if it would have compromised the rolling shutter, the high frame rate, the dynamic range, then no. no. I do prefer to compromise with the, the resolution, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. That was a good choice. I think it's a choice and also like, But we need 12K now. now. Huh? You, know, you know we need 12K now. So. <laughs> 12K in a full frame camera, yeah. yeah. That would be a, a lot of bit rates. That would be a lot of media storage. Oh, it's I, I fine. Think. Yeah, we'll just buy some more For your cars. cats. <laughs> For my cats. Exactly. <laughs> For your cats. Um, we've got a question around the Alpha 7S Mark III pre-order um, timing. So obviously the first delivery uh, will be from September. Um, so if you uh, ordered, like this is uh, for the UK, but it's applicable for uh, uh, most countries in Europe, if you ordered um, to your um, um, kind of like store um, that's uh, range, the Alpha 7S Mark III, obviously, if, if you ordered it, like the one of the first ones you'll get um, 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 in, in priority. Um, so it's September, hopefully, for most of you. Uh, so you can enjoy um, um, from September and, and, and after uh, shooting with this camera. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question, I don't know, like, well, I can quickly answer that. So Sony Alpha 7S Mark III, does this also include HLG, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of like our AGR ready um, profile inside the camera, which, um, it, which it does. So um, some of you that really like the HLG profile and giving you that extra um, Kind of like editing capability without like going too much into, you know, the log profiles and those kind of like heavier um, editing kind of like workflows um, is still available in this camera. Um, another question is Ninja Five ready? Um, well, we cannot really confirm on behalf of Atomos because this is you know their products, um, their codex inside those products, so we cannot really ask Sony confirm that. Um, but obviously, we made the announcement we are working um, with in collaboration with them to make um, the Ninja 5 um, um, compatible as soon as possible. So we'll um, obviously um, announce officially later on um, on that. Um, another, the last one, um, sadly the last one. Um, so at Sun Europe, for a video-centric camera, why haven't you um, changed the PASM control for something dedicated for video with more, um, um, more direct configuration and options. So it's actually something we talked about um, mm -hmm. as early as this lunch with, um, 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 with you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I heard these comments like a lot, like, oh, why didn't you put like a quick, like um, small LCD screen, these kind of things. I think what people need to realize is obviously as much as we focused our improvements um, to, towards the video features, and try to bring like the best experience for filmmakers. Um, we still need to to uh, remind yourselves like a lot of our customers currently of Alpha 7S Mark II are using it as an hybrid shooting camera, mm -hmm. so they still need a quicker access to be moving from um, obviously these kind of like movie modes and to still mode and being able like to shoot like either if they shoot like aperture priority or manual uh, manual priority and etc. They need to be able like to very change very quickly. Um, and this is why we still are keeping that uh, down, even though maybe some of you are not, are not needing it. I'm sure all the shooters will very appreciate we, we kept that in here. Um, I think it was our last question. Uh, thank you all. Um, 
I, I hope we answered most of your questions. Um, if not, I'm sure um, um, you'll be able like to um, um, look at the videos. Um, obviously, these um, two gentlemen have created for this launch. Um, and also our launch videos, all the information on our website, I invite you also to visit Alpha Universe in Europe. We've got like some rich content that can also help you shoot like photography and videography. And some good articles about these two gentlemen where they explained their first experience with the camera. Um, as a conclusion, um, obviously I would like to thank um, the crew that has been, um, um, you know, helping us like setting that up in such a short lead time. Obviously, we've been like in the secrecy for uh, so many months and we are really, really excited to be announcing this camera. Um, as I said, everything is new. Our main purpose with this camera is to provide the best kind of like video quality possible in everyone's hands, but still remaining like a very flexible camera to be adaptive to most of your workflows. Um, I would like specifically to, to thank our, uh, both filmmakers here, um, Olivier Schmidt and, and, um, and Philippe Blum that have been obviously um, and very helpful in creating amazing content, pushing the camera to the limits, um, being here today, taking the time to answer your questions, answer our questions. Um, and um, I would like also obviously to apologize for the audio for like the fourth or fifth time. Uh, it's a bit cheeky at this point, but I'm still apologizing for it. Uh, we really feel that um, and we wanted to give you the best experience. We hope it still was a very good experience, a very informative live stream. I would like to hand over maybe to, to Philip if you have any last words or any like kind of like thank yous you want to give um, to the audience or any specific message around filmmaking as a general statement. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, thank you for getting me involved in it and mm -hmm. letting me use the camera early. And um, please um, don't take it away from me. I know you will. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a, a joy to shoot yeah. with. So... That's always the thing, isn't it? It's like, it, it's you know, you hired me for a job, and yeah. I'm not, I would have done it for free. Yeah, the experience. <laughs> you should have paid me, but the experience of it was uh, <laughs> quite genuine. I wish I should have known yeah. before, like kind of like signing this contract with you. Um, uh, obviously, Olivier, um, you came from France just for this webinar. Obviously, I'm I'm I'm, I'm most precise that as Sony, um, we made sure like. Uh, make um, um, Olivier, yeah. Olivier travel in the best conditions, not to put his house at risk. Um, but thank you for joining us. Really thank appreciate you. coming over to France, doing this amazing short, um, short movie as well for, for this launch and putting the, the camera to a real test. Um, do you have any kind of like thank yous you would like yeah, to give or like any, any, any message you would like to give the audience? So I would like to thank Sony for, for, for this opportunity. It was just amazing. The cam camera was just, just crazy. And I can't wait to be in September. And I would like to thank my team. Mm -hmm. So all the crew who works on the movie, my, all the team. Especially yeah, the paraglider. The especially, paraglider. Especially him. The, yeah, Otherwise the sports it would just guys, be the two of us. Yeah. And all <laughs> the actors and, and, and my team. Yeah, that was an essential, essential part. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank to you. And thank you to your team also to, to put that out like in such a short time. I think it was quite... Quite yeah, impressive it to, was to see this kind of like stressful. quality and, and, and level of production from both of you in, in such conditions. Um, and just as a last message, obviously, we're going to show on the screen. You can join Philip and, and Olivia on their own channels. They have like many videos, also a lot of tutorials about video making, which I think uh, might be interesting uh, of you. Um, once again, um, hope you're all excited about the Alpha 7X Mark III and thank you uh, for joining us today. Goodbye.